Coming up next, The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy. Every Thursday from 4 p.m. right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. People are struggling to have conversations and connect with others that they don't completely agree with on every topic. And I think that's probably the biggest problem that we need to try and solve is how after all this division and after all this separation, do we end up bringing people together again? And what does unity really look like? New Zealand faces some pretty big issues. First one is COVID in the aftermath. There's no getting away from that. Second is racial division. It's being ginned up and it's dangerous. Another issue that maybe people haven't got their head around yet is digital currency. What form does that take? Is it programmable? Will it be used to manipulate behaviour and patterns of behaviour? Those questions need to be asked and answered. How can you have fair, open, democratic government by people who are appointed? It's a ridiculous idea. And if that idea is taken to its zenith, then this country is in real trouble because democracy, one person, one vote, where every vote is of equal value, has got to be the foundation of a modern New Zealand. What's true, what's not true, how our kids are to be educated. And, you know, I have a great fear for the future. I think we know from history where this could end up. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy, right here on RCR. Welcome to The Crunch on Reality Check Radio. I'm your host, Cam Slater, and this is the place we crunch the political issues and cut through the politician's spin. We've got another fantastic show ahead for you this week. My first guests this afternoon are Yarp Nightmans and Joseph Blessings from the Democratic Alliance Umbrella Party that they've set up. We'll be discussing how they're hoping that freedom parties will preserve their support by making it count with an umbrella party. And then I'll be talking with pollster David Farrer to explain in detail what happens to wasted votes that occur when parties fail to make the threshold. We'll touch on some current polling as well. And then a special guest this week, Japanese independent journalist Masoko Ganaha, about what drives her and energizes her as she seeks to tell the truth. Masoko is famous for doorstepping WEF villain Klaus Schwab at Davos earlier this year. And finally, I have a long discussion with political campaigner Simon Lusk about the development and emergence of negative campaigning in New Zealand politics. Does it work? Will it work this election? Who knows? Let's let Simon tell us. And it's a busy afternoon and we've got a lot to get through. And I've got a huge mailbag with important feedback coming into our channels here at RCR. And we're in the last weeks of the election campaign and things are getting very, very interesting with the polls showing a bloodbath for Labour. Don't forget to send comments to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. Welcome back to The Crunch. Today, we're diving deep into a topic that's so crucial for our democracy, for our rights, and for our future. We're talking about the importance of standing up, being counted for what you believe in, and why backing independent journalists is vital in this day and age. But that's not all. We're also tackling the critical issue of informed voting and why this election, more than ever, it's imperative to choose a party that can make it over the 5% MMP threshold. Folks, we live in a world where information is at our fingertips, yet misinformation runs rampant. Controlled media and our politicians are the ones that are misinforming us. And it's become increasingly clear that we need to be vigilant, proactive, 
and well-informed about the issues that matter most to us. It's not enough to merely form an opinion. We must stand up and be counted for what we believe in. The power of our voices collectively raised is how we hold our leaders accountable. Independent journalists are our watchdogs, our truth seekers, and our champions of transparency. They're the unsung heroes in a world where clickbait and sensationalism often drown out the facts. Backing these independent journalists is not just an act of support, it's an investment in the health of our democracy. But being informed isn't just about knowing the headlines. It's about understanding the nuances of policies and issues. Too often, politicians with ulterior motives can sneak through legislation while we're still trying to gather our thoughts. We must be proactive in our pursuit of knowledge, never caught flat-footed by those who wish to push their agendas unchecked. And speaking of being proactive, let's talk about elections. In a democratic system like ours, voting is one of the most powerful tools we possess. It's our way of shaping the future we want to see. But this election, let's remember that perfection should not be the enemy of progress. While no party may align with 100% of our beliefs, we must prioritize what truly matters. It's about finding a party that may not have everything you support, but aligns with a significant portion of your values, let's say 80%. But here's the thing, folks. Voting for a party that won't make it over the 5% MMP threshold might feel good. You might be sticking it to the man but it's like sending a message in a bottle that never reaches its destination. So my fellow citizens and listeners, as we gear up for this upcoming election, let's remember the power of our voices, the importance of independent journalism, and the need to stay informed. Together, we can make a difference, uphold the principles we hold dear, and ensure that our democracy thrives. Thanks for tuning into The Crunch. Remember, stand up, be counted, back independent journalism, and make your vote count. It's our responsibility and privilege as citizens. Now let's crack into the show. Yarp Nightmans and Joseph Blessing saw a need for an alternative umbrella party and decided to form the Democratic Alliance. They don't want to lead the party. They just want to provide the infrastructure that would allow freeing parties and other minor parties to have a vehicle to assist in making sure their votes count this election. They're here now to talk about what they've created. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank Good you, afternoon. Ron. Thank you. So we've got a, a million small parties that have been formed up, especially around the freedom movement. And now you guys have launched the Democratic Alliance. Can you tell us what that means and what it's all about? Okay, I'll I'll just launch in and, and give you a little bit of a background as to the vision that we stand for, the, the party. So our party vision is to have true democracy and freedom in New Zealand, where individual rights are valued and we are governed by political representatives who listen and work with the people businesses, food producers, and support families in a safe and caring society. Really, while Freedoms NZ is also an umbrella party, uh, and and we are as well, it is evident that the remaining minor parties won't join them. And um, as a result, we um, have developed a second umbrella party option Mm -hmm. with a different valued approach to help unite the parties and enhance and gain a, um, gain a collective voice in Parliament. Mm. That is if they are um, able to work collectively together and come in under this umbrella working in diversity. Mm. And that's where we um, call that um, unity in diversity, where each party can maintain its own party individualism and, and their own party policies. I'll let Joseph talk a little bit more about how we've come about and the story around that. Well, I'm actually originally started the um, Yes Aotearoa Party, which is still an unregistered party. 
Um, mm -hmm. We've been um, campaigning for that party um, in last year, particularly. And um, lots of times when we actually talk to people, we want to find out what's their, what their thinking is. It's like really genuinely listening to the people. And right. very often we came across that call for, you guys need to unite. You're not going to make it on your own. Mm. And we're just having the same drama again as last time. We don't have a proper opposition. And the more we heard that, of course, the more we took that on board and said, hey, we need, really need to do something about this because – Actually, by then, when we started to uh, form the idea of the Democratic Alliance, by then the Freedoms and Z Party has been already alive and going for about half a year. Right. And they didn't get proper traction. And we looked into the psychology of that too and thought, well, actually, we can understand to some extent why that is happening. And we said, okay, let's do something additional to that. We didn't want to be really in competition because our dream would be have the big unity formation. Yeah? Mm. But uh, at least for now, we said let's start a new umbrella with also a different um, set of values. That's not all different, but to some extent different. And yeah. we also were quite, um, uh, how can I say, inspired mm. by actually putting in a new set of values, which we call the new paradigm in politics. Right, so yeah. it started, and then we did the normal thing. As every party, when they want to get registered, they have to go through the motions of getting uh, members and doing all the forms properly, and da da da, and so on. And so we uh, labored away over the months, and finally we got registered. I uh, um, yeah, a couple of weeks ago or so. Right. So the Democratic Alliance as an umbrella party is registered now. Yes, it is, and that. Your desire is to have that as a vehicle or a safe haven for some of the minor parties that are out there to coexist if they can't fit inside the existing umbrella party that's out there. Yeah, exactly. So basically, when when you look at the minor parties that uh, remain that are not part of the existing Freedoms NZ Umbrella Party, and they don't want to join that Umbrella Party because uh, for whatever rhyme or reason, they cannot work with uh, the Tamaki equation within there. So, right. which is really the driving force why we set out to um, put this party together. After we spoke to each of those party leaders and they gave that as the reason, that's when we really um, put energy and, and motion in behind the creation of the Democratic Alliance. Now that we've got the Democratic Alliance and it's taken some time to get it registered, mm. we are now at this eight hour um, basically going to them and having conversations about the vehicle is ready, jump on board, and together we can collectively pull the voter percentages together and it will be a win-win because together you are stronger and together you can get over the 5% threshold. Mm. However, when we've met with the Democracy NZ, Leighton Baker, New Zeal, New Conservative, and we try to get um, NZ Loyal on, on board as well in those conversations, but that door has remained shut. Um, but at least the others pulled a pew up around the table and we've had conversations, but mm -hmm. those negotiations are knife edge. Yeah. One minute you're you're talking positively about the opportunities, and then the next thing, someone becomes fearful about having to give up their party image or ideologies. So mm -hmm. they think, and then all of a sudden they turn the other way. But we're reassuring them and saying. It is a no-brainer. You will be able to retain your own party ideologies and image, mm. but collectively you can pull your um, voter base together to ensure that for your voters, and we need to keep on putting the attention back on the voter base, they are looking for different voices and a makeup of these parties in Parliament, the only reason why we need to think of this is because of the 5% threshold mm. equation in MMP. Otherwise, if they don't unite, people might as well forget about voting for them because they're too fragmented and they're throwing their vote away. And you well know that, Kim. 
I absolutely know that. And, you know, I'm getting a lot of pushback from listeners when I say that if you vote for one of these minor parties, that isn't going to make the 5% threshold. You're not only throwing your vote away, you're effectively, because of the way that the calculations work and the effect of, like, let's say there's a, a, a party, let's call it a freedom party, and it gets 3% in the election. Yes. That equates to four seats. That's four seats that now get taken away from the freedom vote and reallocated to what I call the winning parties. Mm. And they may or may not be freedom aligned. In fact, there's a very high chance that none of them are. And so your freedom vote effectively gets placed with a non-freedom party as a result of the seat reallocation which happens when you don't meet the threshold. And this is the the two questions that I always ask uh, new parties or leaders. Uh, what are your plans to win an electorate seat? And what are your plans to win 250,000 votes? Because if they can't answer the, both of those questions in a cogent way, they're not going to do it. Mm. That's and, 150,000, I think, to get over. Well, yeah, 150,000. Yeah, 150, but. The point remains, 150,000 votes is huge. It's it a is. huge number. And you know, I, I put this to Brian Tamaki himself. I said, how are you going to get 150,000 votes? Oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And there was no specifics around it. And I said, well, you've got around 100,000 members of your church, but they don't all mm. vote. They don't all vote for you or the parties that are associated with you. It's much less. It's like about 10% of them do. And this is a difficult thing. And, you know, uh, what you guys are trying to do is to put the, together this umbrella. But, of course, you're dealing with people with massive egos. <laughs> Politicians, by their very nature, have massive egos. Yep. How do you envisage getting around those egos? Because in order to have a list, someone has to be first. Mm. And someone has to be second, and someone has to be third. Have you devised a strategy to get around that little issue? Because that's a that's a showstopper for some of these parties, which are mm. you know, usually named after the the person who's founded the party, or you know they're the only person that's got a, a, a public presence. So how are you going to get around this list issue? Well, uh, Ken, it's an interesting one that you're raising and we've been well aware of most of what you're saying. The core issue is, like you say, getting actually one party to be really a um, the courageous one who is the le leading the pack to actually say, hey, we need to do this and I'm going to be in. I jump in right now. Yeah. Mm. But at the moment, um, we do have one who is tentative and the second one who is even more tentative, but yeah. they're all in the in the place of, uh, it's too light. It's too light. It's too light. Uh, saying that, we actually got a, what I call a recipe for success mm -hmm. to do this last minute. And uh, it's quite likely, it's very well outlined. It's very simple, actually. And um, it's doable. But uh, interesting enough, we, we, um, we sent that out just two days ago to those various minority parties that we want to uh, see joining in the first instance as in we have got the like the the preferred ones to join which are the more major minor yeah. parties and then yeah. the second, second uh level of that doesn't mean they are less important but it's important to have more the the stronger parties first right yeah uh, but so far none of them have been genuinely open to understand how that recipe for success actually what it looks like none of them well, so you can a... see that there is there is a a real in inhibitor in there, whatever the psychology uh, means and says there. Yeah. But that's what we are facing at the moment. Yeah, it's a, there's a – look, in politics, you're dealing with people who have a severe narcissistic personality disorder, you know, <laughs> and, and it's their way or the highway. And the smaller the party, the more uh, – the stronger that it is. Mm. Um, now, you said you've approached NZ Loyal. Mm. Yes, we've approached NZ Royal and Liz Gunn multiple times to come on the show, and uh, we constantly get rebuffed. And but their loyalists, their their members, are constantly emailing 
the show and the other hosts as well on Reality Check Radio and saying, you've got to get Liz Gunn on, you've got to get Liz Gunn on. And it's proving almost impossible to mm. get Liz Gunn to front for anything. Uh, and, you know, it's a natural audience for her, but there's this rumor that we've got this conspiracy to block her coming on, but we've found that the block is actually from Liz Gunn herself. Are you finding the same thing? Yeah, Absolutely. we're finding we're finding that door is very much um, closed. Um, every time we go and knock on it, um, there's not an ability or an openness to actually enter into dialogue, be it either one-on-one. -on -one, it might be the odd little chat conversation, yeah. but no longer telephone exchange. And we definitely, when we got the other party leaders of those other parties I mentioned previously together in, on, on a uh, Zoom call, to collectively explore what the the opportunities are here of working in unity. Uh, and it was like, uh, basically, the invitation was, come and join us. There's no uh, obligation to actually unite, but let's have a conversation at least. But um, the belief is, is that um, what Liz has come back with is, she said two things, really. Um, one was, I'm not in, in interested in recreating the single source of truth, which I thought was a bit of a low blow um, given mm -hmm. the, the circumstances. Secondly, basically the feedback was there are 2 million votes sitting on the sideline and 2 million voters that um, never bothered to vote. And she was she's, she's of the belief that NZ Loyal is going to re-engage those 2 million voters that are sitting on the sideline Whereas um, basically across the freedom community, mm. we've got a relatively small pool of voters and we're all vying, 11 parties now, mind you, including mm. ourselves. We we haven't wanted to add to that split. Yeah. And we're trying to do whatever we can to actually reduce the amount of parties mm. within that mi minor freedom party uh, space. But like if you've got 11 parties going for that relatively small uh, voter base, you know what the outcome is going to be. Yeah, 11 parties with 10,000 votes. Hmm. Uh, Ken, I would like uh, to say something about um, what your question before about uh, the rebuffing from Liz. Hmm. I've actually been in touch with Liz in the last week, uh, this text, um, a number of times, and uh, trying to um, invite her to actually come on board to talk properly. Mm -hmm. um, so none of the uh, offers so far have been eventual, but uh, what I've always got back is a, like a, like you say, a rebuff. And the rebuff was more on a psychological level, like more to my person, my personality that I'm not trustworthy, um, that I'm not a Kiwi. Uh, yeah, I mean, what? <laughs> honestly, I mean, I actually really appreciate this personally because I got to know her in person, right? Yes. And I, there's some love there for her, absolutely, yeah? And I appreciate what she's trying to do. But yep. that is un really unfortunate that she actually doesn't really be in service to the people, which she actually says she is. But she is not because she's not open enough to actually talk to all of us to find the best possible solution to make this work. Well, that's exactly what I've been saying for the last few weeks on this show is that we need to stop the polarization that exists mm. within New Zealand politics, that we need exactly. to have courageous conversations, even if they're a little bit uncomfortable. You know, it's why I maintain relations with other commentators and other people who do what I do across the political spectrum, you know, guys like Matt McCartan and Chris Trotter, you know, from the left and then people in the ACT Party from the right and everyone in between, including the Green Party as well. So, yeah. Joseph, you would have felt that was highly personal, that, that comment about not being a Kiwi, considering how long you've been involved in New Zealand politics on the Green side of politics. Now, you know, we've probably got more in common than you would imagine, um, mm. uh, but there's just a few parts of the Green Party that, today that I don't agree with and presumably you don't either because you've decided to go down this path, which is, with all due respect, a bit of motherhood and apple pie and, and some a great deal of hope. Mm. But at least you're trying, you know, and that's all we can ask of people is that they try and maintain these conversations and these courageous, this courageous discourse across the political divide. 
And what I'm seeing with the freedom movement is the, the it's almost hostile in some pockets of it to any mm. idea that you're not pure enough or you're not clean enough or you're not this enough. You know, they've always got an excuse to not talk. Well, yeah. they'll, end, they'll end up not talking to anyone. There's too much infighting, and 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 I guess we are in political um, campaign mo- mode, mind you, where yeah. the gloves are off, and the 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 parties, as I said before, are all vying for the same amount of small um, uh, voter base. Mm. But that's no excuse. Um, I mean, if dreams were free, I I, I just think that uh, you know the the ultimate equation, and and if Winston was to um, to want to you know, really transform our nation for the better mm. um, and and take a lead as as he's near the end of his career and really he could um, step into the mix and corral the um, the flock together and get the, the democracy and Zs and the NZ loyals and the Leighton Bakers, et cetera, together under one umbrella, right? And mm. um, we could then really transform the future of our country once and for all. And I don't think we would just get over the 5% threshold like that, we would blow this, um, you know, uh, percentage volume out out of the water and we'd get a good number, like maybe even 20-odd seats in in Parliament collectively together. Mm. And I think we would all be richly rewarded because the voters that all these parties stand for Mm. would would actually reward this collective unity royally basically so but even without winnie i think the others could do it but they need to um work together in in unity i mean when you look at the different parties and their policies yeah they have got so much more in common than that they have in yeah, in, in difference exactly you, you know the outcome the outcome is the same they mm. they want the same things i mean you know, I had this discussion with Matt McCartan on the show a few weeks ago. We both want the same thing. We want a vibrant New Zealand economy with people employed and meaningful jobs. We want, you know, low uh, interest rates and all of these. Sort. We all want the same thing. It's just a different pathway for each of us to get to there. And mm. what we have to identify, and you can only do this by talking with people, is identify the things that we have in common and don't worry about the things that we don't have in common because the common good is 80% of of everything but the 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 problem with with minor parties and I've seen this over the years you know there's i call them purists they want everything to be 100% the way they want it and they're not prepared to compromise but politics is the art of compromise it has mm. to be the art of compromise. That's why Certainly. we've got MMP. We brought in MMP because we wanted politicians to compromise and stop dictating to us. We were sick yep. of the Muldoons and the Roger Douglases of the world dictating it to us. We were sick of Jim Bolger dictating to us. We voted in MMP so that parties would work together, mm. and now we've got an opportunity for parties to work together, and they won't. <laughs> you know. And that's the thing that and I've been trying to to say to people on this show. We're asking people to unite. We're asking mm, people mm. to join together. And they're the ones that are refusing and ignoring the people. And aren't they just being like the politicians we want to get rid of? Yeah, well, you do need to ask the question. If they can't work together and they are so hard-nosed about it and their doors are closed that they won't even come together and have the conversation, are they the politicians that we do want to be our leaders? Mm. And I think I know the answer to that. Um, I think you've really hit the nail on the head there, Cam, in, in, in relation to saying there needs to be compromise, there needs to be the art of coming together having the dialogue, building relationships, uh, building bridges where you need to and um, working together and and um, for the greater good of the voter, for the greater good of our nation. And, and if they don't get that before the election, well, they better darn well get it pretty, pretty soon after the election because to be even a politician, it's the fine art of... of um, relationship management mm. and and striking deals 
Yep. Uh, and if you can't do that um, between the, your common flock, how are you going to be able to do that with the with with the others of of wider thinking scope within mm-hmm. within Parliament? Yeah, yeah so, I, recall the, I recall the time when we were at Camp Freedom at the protest in Wellington. Mm. I was there for 22 days yeah. from, from day one. And it was so heartening that we all talked to each other, yeah. regardless of our race, our history. We just were there for our common good and making a difference here to the mandates and to uh, to organize some kind of uh, inquiry into the vaccine issue and so on. We wanted to have a freedom where we can actually look after our own well-being and not being dictated and so on and so on. Yeah. And it was so refreshing. There was so much love there, so much heart. We were looked after by, by through meals and we, we pitched together our different services and we mm. it all happened. And there was no leader there that was obvious. Yeah, people took initiative where we uh, felt like it was necessary and responsible. Mm. Now, where has that gone? That energy? Yeah, mm. now we would be in a place where we could actually really replicate a lot of that in in the new movement of a unity movement. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't there as long as as you were, but we could have been standing shoulder to shoulder there. We're not knowing each other at that time. You so, know, I'm, I I met people that politically have been opposed to me in the past or opposed to the parties I supported in the past. But what that protest showed me is that the old parties, Labour and National especially, no longer care for mm. everyone in this in this country. And there was a whole bunch of people there saying, we want you to listen to us, please. And they said no. And now we've got you know guys like yourself that are, have formed an umbrella party, and, and it's putting egos aside, and it's saying let's all band together. And the very people who stood there on the forecourt of Parliament and said we want you to listen are now not listening themselves. And it it disappoints me that that energy that you talked about, Joseph, has been lost and dissipated mm. because egos have taken over, and egos are the problem that is brought us down this pathway to where we are today. Sadly, and, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, who would have ever thought that me, you know, who's described as a hard right conservative, would be happily discussing hugs and, you know, <laughs> t- t- parties that talk about hugs and working together and, you know, with a gre- former Green Party members or, you know, who would ever have thought we'd be fellow travellers? But we are, because that's the circumstances we we've found ourselves in. And mm. and it's not right and left anymore. That that paradigm is gone. It's not right and left. It's freedom versus control. Mm. But the freedom parties want control. So it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of like forming a new circle. Mm. <laughs> uh, and this is where under the Democratic Alliance, if they were to come in under the umbrella, if there's any fears and any trust issues, Mm. collectively that would be alleviated because collectively one party would keep the other party more honest. It is sad that um, they have lost contact with the voters Mm. because their voting base, is is their cries for unity has only got stronger. The amount of individuals that are coming to to us um, and 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 those within our Democratic Alliance Party group and through social media that are saying, "Why don't you unite? When are the other parties going to jump on board?" has only got stronger that voice, mm. and we do still have time. We've got time right up until Rit Day, which is the fourteenth of September, and we will do whatever we can at, at our end to rally the troops, but uh, currently it's like herding cats and uh, they're not wanting to basically unite. But if only the party leads and their party boards were to understand that actually, A, it's best for their their voter base, for the people, Mm. and B, it's the only way that they will end up getting a voice in, in the House and actually start to have an influence in this government. And making their vote count. Correct, and and that votes don't end up yeah being wasted as you say before, and and going to the nets or, or, or labour, and that that's the very real risk. And you know, and you've got people out there that say what 
that what exactly what I've been saying and what Sandra Gowdy was been saying is wrong. But they're being very particular about why they're saying that we're wrong. They're saying that, you know, the votes don't change. Well, no, the votes don't change, but the effect does. Mm. Right. And as I said, if 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 Freedom Party A gets three percent, that's effectively four seats. The Electoral Commission comes along and goes, well, you didn't uh, make make the 5% threshold. Those four seats now get reallocated to the winning parties, none of which represent freedom. And the system is rigged in that way. And, of course, all the other major parties don't want the uh, voters, the minor party voters, to to know that Mm. because it does result in additional seats for them. So... um, but yeah, like I, I said, if if we can corral them together in, into one unity by the 14th of September, then we will march ahead. If they don't, and if we are left without the Democratic Alliance Party, without substance to it, without the actual component parties, we will have to question whether we carry on going into this election because we do not want to add to the continual split off the vote, mm. that's that's not going to be beneficial for the voters themselves. No. So how can uh how can people find out more information about the Democratic Alliance? On our website. Yep. And the the URL is democratic alliance dot nz. That's right. Yes, correct. Yep. And the other uh, thing is we've got a telegram channel. Oh, yes. The Democratic Alliance, because we are uh, running on the smell of an oily rag, to say the least, and, mm. and we are a grassroots, bottom up approach. Um, if anybody that is interested that wants to get onto social media, uh, come and knock on our door. We would love to, you know, get information out further afield on either Facebook or Twitter or, or whatever the other pro- providers might be. The other thing that we have put out, and thankfully, and I would like to really acknowledge uh, Voice Media, MJ at Voice Media for that, is there is currently a call out to all these party leaders to corral together uh, in a in a forum, a collective forum, and to have a collective discussion about not only what each party stands for and that they can have a debate across all the party party leaders, Mm. But also um, to to talk a bit about why aren't we not uniting together? Well, yeah, it's, a, it's a panel discussion, yeah, yeah. Yes. You, you need a panel discussion, but uh, you That's know, the, you use the right terminology. It's like herding cats, and I'd go a step further in saying they're black cats in a dark room that you're trying to herd. I've got this image in the of a um, the leaders asking their for now their voters their supporters to go into this valley because that's where the promise is to get become successful yeah and the leader doesn't see that it's actually a cul-de-sac and you can't get out without actually returning yeah and that's what it feels like that all these various minority leaders are actually also they should know but they don't want to really face the truth that it's a hopeless case on their own to achieve anything they still lead them into that cul-de-sac valley, the dead valley. It's really sad because there's a lot of people that have a lot of faith in the leaders mm. of those parties. And, you know, my experience in politics, and it might people might say it's deeply cynical, but it's based on reality. And, you know, that's why I have this show on Reality Check Radio is to deal with reality, not with what I call hopium. And yeah. there's, an, there's a great deal of hoping out there. It's very addictive. Uh, and then what's going to happen when the hopium wears off on October the 15th is they're going to then have copium, which is equally addictive, trying to work out what happened. Mm. And what, ha- what happened is you didn't work together. Correct. And well, we should already know from the 2020 election they yeah. didn't work together. Three years later, look at the state of our nation now. If they were to have corralled together and at least provided some pushback in, in, in Parliament, we may not be as far down the, down the road as we are today. If they don't collectively understand now that they need to corral together, then where will we be in another three years' time? We don't have another three years' time. We can't wait till the 2026 election 
will be, you know, under digital ID, will be under, you know, um, the, the, the hate speech law will have rolled out upon our nation and you won't be able to say much anymore, which is credible in advance to the election mm. without being shut down for it. I mean, there's a reason why Joseph and I have made ourselves to be the party secretariats for the Democratic Alliance and that we haven't actually become party leaders ourselves because we don't want to create yet another stumbling block yeah. for them to have another excuse of not coming in into the fold and joining joining together. So what you're doing then is providing an infrastructure and a framework for others to lead their yes. supporters towards the promised land, which is getting into parliament so that you can actually have a material difference. Because you can't have any difference sitting on the outside of parliament. You can't make any difference at exactly. all. Exactly. You've got to have a voice in there and it needs to be a, a substantial size. Otherwise you run the risk, you know, of emulating Winston Peters over the years where he just gets five percent and mm. can't deliver on the promises, and then everyone criticizes him because he can't deliver on the promises. They say he never delivers. Well, the voters didn't deliver him the votes to allow him to do that, but it's a circular argument. You go round and round in circles and nobody's yeah. any further ahead. Yeah, exactly. Well, I admire that you guys are trying your best to get these groups together, and hopefully the listeners of this show will then start exerting a little bit of pressure on those leaders to say, hey, Talking never hurt anybody. Mm. And, and just talk and you might find there's a there's a level of agreement that's acceptable. You know, is it 80% or 70% or 90%? Let's say it's 80% of agreement. Well, the other 20% can be ironed out simply by talking a bit more. Correct. And we encourage your listeners to to go to those party leaders and to to knock on their door and to call them out for uh, remaining isolated from one another and and to to really encourage them to take a risk. I mean, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and over again without a different result. Here we We're have, expecting a different result. Yeah. Here <laughs> we have a an opportunity to do something different. Yeah. The vehicle yeah. is ready and waiting. All we need, now need is for the parties to jump on board and to do something different collectively together and to get collectively over the 5% threshold together for the people, not for themselves, for all those that stood united at Camp Freedom. Yeah. Yeah, I think we owe it to them. We owe it to our people that we do this. Well, you guys are at least giving it a crack, and I admire you for that. Sadly, though, I don't think uh, many of these parties will see that pathway and they will learn a very bitter lesson uh, mm. come come the election. And then hopefully then from the wreckage that occurs, something will rise out of that. And I think that is my overriding impression of where this election is heading right now. And it mm. might seem negative and it might seem harsh, but I've been involved in politics for most of my life and that's what I'm looking at right now. And yeah. Anyone who tries to uh, fix that up, well, I'll all power to them. And for you guys, I, I wish you all the best that you do do that. And for the next few, few days, you can wallop these people around the ears and get them to actually listen. Well, we'll keep on going until, like I say, writ day. We're not giving up just yet. So good. The calls Thanks. are still going on. Well, uh, Yarp and Joseph, all the best for the future, and hopefully you can get something to happen, and then maybe we can have another chat before the election if that works. I look forward to it. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, thank, Cam. Thank you. I was genuinely impressed by their attitude, and I hope some minor parties can get on board what they've created. But this close to the election means that it is an uphill battle. Yarp and Joseph certainly mean well and deserve to be treated better than they have been by some of those minor parties. Don't forget to send comments on the interview to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Our text machine is now live. Send us your thoughts by texting your message to 2057. That's 2057. So get in touch with us now.
RCR is on a mission to revive Honest Media, and now you too can be an integral part of it by joining the RCR Foundation Members Club. Receive exclusive benefits only available to club members, including your own backstage pass to join the hosts for interactive behind-the-scenes discussions, along with our all-new daily curated news summary, RCR Bytes, that's delivered to your email box every morning, keeping you on the pulse of the news that matters in just a few minutes per day. To find out more, visit realitycheck.radio slash members to see how you can join the mission that's making a difference. Making a difference. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy right here on RCR. David Farah is, in my opinion, New Zealand's best pollster. He's forgotten more than others know about polling. And David's going to explain now the effect of the wasted vote, how seats are allocated, and why it's important to choose who you vote for carefully so that your vote is not wasted. Welcome, David, back to The Crunch. Hey, great to be back, Cam. So I had Sandra Gowdy on my show a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the wasted vote. And Sandra was saying that uh, if you vote for a party that doesn't make the 5% threshold or win an electorate seat, effectively, your vote doesn't count. And worse than that, let's say there was a party, let's call it the Black Party, uh, let's say they got 3%, but didn't meet the threshold and didn't win a seat. That's effectively four seats that then, due to the calculations of MMP and the rules, get reallocated to the other parties. Was that statement true or false? The statement's basically true. It's not quite that they're reallocated, but Sandra's quite correct that your vote, if it's for a party that doesn't meet the threshold, will not determine seats in Parliament. It, it it will go to those seats that would have gone to that party will go to other parties. Right. So let's put a scenario together so that so that listeners can understand. We've got, let's say, a red party, blue party, yellow party, green party, black party, and then we've got, say, let's say freedom A, freedom B, and freedom C, right? Yeah. So red, blue green, yellow, and black all get across the 5% threshold. So their uh, seats are determined by the percentage of the vote that they got. There's a formula, but it's basically proportional to their vote. Key thing here is on election night, you see all the tables. Everyone vote gets counted, right? Yes. In last election, there were 18 parties or something. So... Your vote is counted and it gets put up on a table. But what they then do is they say, have you got over 5%? Yes, no. Mm -hmm. Or have you won an electorate seat? Yes, no. If the answer to both of them is no, they then throw those parties away for the purpose of allocating seats. So the votes count that they're up on a table, but when it comes to who gets seats, any votes for those parties are literally disregarded. So if you've got, say, Freedom B Party gets 3%, because people want to vote for a party that reflects their views about freedoms and rights and all of those sorts of things, yeah. but it gets 3%. That's effectively four seats that that represents. What happens to those four seats because they didn't reach the threshold or win an electorate seat? What happens to those four seats? effectively what happens is not that they're literally taken off them and given to other parties, but the way the formula works Mm. is very roughly two of those seats will go to centre-right parties and two of those seats will go into centre-left parties. So if we take your Freedom Party, if what's motivating you is you hated what the government did over COVID and you vote for a party that doesn't make the 5%, effectively half of those votes will help government parties get re-elected and half will go to the other side. It's not quite as simple as that because it depends how many actual Mm. votes blue, red, green get. But what it means is you get no seats, 
the other parties, instead of having 116 seats to split between them, get 120 seats between them. So those four seats are going to go to one of the parties that made the threshold. So if you are a voter that wants to send a message against the government and you're supporting one of these minor parties that doesn't look like it is going to get across the threshold, how can you ensure then that you are voting against the government? The most certain way is you vote for a party that is certain to make the threshold Mm -hmm. and has explicitly stated they're going to throw the government out. Where you get a bit of judgment is if you've got a party near the threshold, you have to make a call, well, I prefer them to one of these other parties bound to make the 5%. So do I think they'll make it? And here's what my general rule of thumb is. Look, you know, keep looking at the polls during the campaign. I've never seen a party that's been polling under 3% suddenly in a surprise make 5% on election night. Yep. Now, you have suddenly had things change. Like Peter Dunn had an amazing leaders debate and he went from 1% to 6% in the polls. But you saw that happen in the polls. There is a sort of not quite exception to my rule of under 3%. Really, actually, I've never seen a party under 4% end up making 5 with the exception being New Zealand first, because Winston is such a known quantity and so good at publicity, antagonises the media. Mm. So my general rule of thumb is if you're under 3%, you're not going to make it. If you're 3 to 4%, You're not going to make it unless maybe you're Winston. If you're over 4%, then there's a reasonable chance you can make it. You know, polls and margin of errors, et cetera. So if you really like that party, it's worthwhile. But if you're under 3%, it's very, very rare that makes it. The one who came closest was Colin Craig in 2000. And I'm not sure if it was 11 or 14, Cam, but... He was actually polling between 4 and 5%, and he might have made 5% if he hadn't had his press secretary resign. It's yeah. something you know about. I know a bit about that, yeah. <laughs> you know, the week before the election with some allegations there, et cetera. But he had been polling at that 4% mark quite consistently for some months. Yeah. And we're not seeing that, are we, for anybody that would be nominally labelled a freedom party. You know, you, no. we're talking about democracy in New Zealand, NZ Loyal. New conservatives. New conservatives. None of them are breaking the even the 1%, are they, with the exception maybe of top? Yeah, top sometimes get to 2 3%. Sometimes you'll see an individual poll might have them at 2 2.5%. I always say, and I include this with mine in there, don't just go off the courier poll, average the polls out to really yeah. get an idea of, of, of that. Because when you're talking a poll of a thousand people, you know, two and a half percent is 25 people. So you might have just had a dozen people that week who were a bit more friendly. What you really want to be looking out for is they're getting above three percent in more than one poll. And so then it comes down to compromises, doesn't it? You have to look at a party and you say, well, these are the things that are important to me. If I get 80% of those, I'd be happy with that. Because no one's going to get a party that gives them 100% of what they want. Not really. Oh, absolutely. Well, there was a great saying, Keith Holyoke, when he was prime minister, said he only agreed with 80% of what his own government did. Now, I always remarked, and of course you knew him too, that Muldoon, I suspect, was agreed with 100% of what his government did. He was such a domineering figure. Mm. You think about the US. Like In 2016, people had a choice between Hillary and Donald, right? Yeah, and two that, bad choices. <laughs> yeah, that was what people felt. But some of them then voted for the Green candidate or the Libertarian candidate, right? Mm. And... If you're a left-wing voter and you voted for the Green candidate because you really didn't like Hillary, well, you got Donald Trump elected. And likewise, you know, in 2000, Al Gore lost the election because some people on the left voted for him over George W. Bush. So, yeah, look, if you, yeah, it's, I'm all for you vote for the party closest to your principles, absolutely. Yeah. But 
if you actually think the country is desperately in need of change, so it's not just like, oh, I could be happy with four or five parties. I have a slight preference for party A. But mm. you really think the incumbent government's terrible. You really have to think about, okay, do I stand on my principles here or do I make sure I get a change of government, even if it's my second or third choice party? Right. And that's, I think, where a lot of people who are listeners to this show are finding themselves. They're mired and supporting a party that has no chance of meeting the threshold or winning an electorate seat. You know, Democracy New Zealand's got everything pinned on Matt King winning in Northland. We've seen two polls in Northland that say that's not going to happen. Um, there's likely and a third to be a th- one coming soon. No, a third one coming soon. Don't know what it will say. We haven't started it yet. Yeah, but you you deal with probabilities and margins and that your gut feel says it's not going to change an awful lot. Um. I'd be surprised if who the leading candidate changes. It will be interesting to see how some of the others are doing, et cetera. So, yeah, it's just a ranking of where second, third, fourth, and fifth comes. Yeah, but look, Northland's not a foregone conclusion in that if people really didn't want the front runner, you could get tactical voting once they see who's got the best chance. But that's less likely to happen in Northland. Islam is the perhaps more likely one where you could get a, like, if people really didn't want National to win, you could get Labour voters saying, well, we've got no chance of keeping the seat, so maybe we'll tactically vote for RAF. Now, I don't think that will happen because, actually, I've been involved in campaigns where you're trying to get people to vote tactically and you need to start around three, four months out getting that message. It's not sort of a last-minute thing. Yeah, I, I'm picking that RAF won't get there for, for top in Ireland. The one that could have that sort of effect take place but won't materially change the end result is the possibility of Brooke Van Velden beating Simon O'Connor in Tamaki. And ACT has got a strategy of doing that, and they've been running that strategy for three or four months. Is that a possibility that Simon O'Connor could find himself, because he's so far down the list, actually losing because the Labour and Green supporters in Tamaki, knowing that their vote doesn't count at all really, could upset the apple cart, vote against Simon O'Connor by backing Brooke Van Velden for, for the ACT Party? Yeah, that is definitely a plausible scenario. Having said that, I haven't seen any signs from sort of the Labour hierarchy to do that possibly because as much as they probably aren't great fans of National generally or Simon, I think they don't see it in their long-term interest to have act with two electorate seats. The left has always wanted to not act out of parliament. They uh, want to change the law so that you, if you're under 5%, even if you win an electorate seat, you don't get list MPs. Now, as it happens, Act's now polling pretty well. So I haven't seen signs that Labour's going to do that, but that is going to be that tactical decision Labour voters in Tamaki will make is do they vote for the Labour candidate or do they vote tactically? There's always a risk voting tactically that the people who tick the ACT candidate and then by default go straight across and tick ACT as well. And so <laughs> so you get a, yes, you're voting tactically, but also you run the risk of them doing both ticks for the same party, which wasn't what you kind of intended. <laughs> from no, the- and... There was an interesting case in the US about it wasn't tactical voting, but tactical campaigning where the Democrats got their packs to spend lots of money attacking the most right wing candidates in Republican primaries. And of course, having Democrats attack them saying, oh, they're too right wing, help them in the Republican primaries. So... It worked in that they all won the Republican primaries, but what the Democrats were counting on was they would be weaker general election candidates. Now, they got it right. They beat almost every one of those Republican candidates in the general election. But if they had miscalculated, they would have then ended up being responsible for electing some of the most right-wing, election-denying Republican candidates there are, rather than more moderate Republicans. So there's always that risk with tactical voting. If it works, it's great. If it doesn't work, 
you can end up saying you really don't like. Do you think that this right-left argument or the right-left paradigm in politics these days is still valid, or are we talking now a, a bigger change from right and left? We're talking about globalism versus nationalism or control versus freedom. Yeah, look, that's a great question. There's still some who see it traditional economic terms left-right, but I think populism, anti-establishmentism, I'd probably call it, I see that with the, the freedom parties a lot, is certainly quite a big fact. And look, if you look at the election tax policies, for example, I mean, nationals leaving the 39% tax rate in place, I understand absolutely why they're doing that politically, but they're actually campaigning on we're going to give a millionaire the exact same tax cut as someone on $70,000. That's not a huge right-left divide. That's the sort of thing, you know, um, any moderate party could do, etc. I think this election, I think competence is a factor. I think there is that anti-establishments a factor, but for a large portion of the electorate, maybe 40, 50%, it is still pretty classical left-right. But we saw last election, National got 25% because Labour was seen as competent on COVID. Uh, We've learned our lesson there probably. And where Labour picked up the most votes were all the traditional national areas, rural New Zealand, etc., all the, the wealthy seats. They won the party vote in every seat except Epson. So that tells me that, no, people aren't just voting on this of economic left-right. Of course, the economy's tanked since then and is in really bad shape. I mean, the projections from Treasury are awful. The levels of debt, you know, I, I remember the Labour Party campaigning against John Key and his government, producing charts with the debt levels going up ignoring the fact that we'd had the Christchurch, two Christchurch earthquakes which required recovery and borrowing to do that. Those borrowing levels that were under John Key are a fraction of what the Ardern Hipkins regime has ended up borrowing, and we're in a very dire strait now, and we're seeing that the penalty of that was inflation out of control, interest rates uh, going to levels that we really haven't seen since the 1990s. Yeah, and what's quite scary too, Cam, is global economic shocks tend to come around every 10 years. Mm. And what good economic management is, is pay your debt down and get your debt low when it's good times. So as I was 73, we had the oil shock. Mm. 87 was the share market crash. Yep. 99 or 98 was the Asian crisis. And 2008 was the GFC. Now, here's the thing. People think we've had the shock because of COVID. COVID was a physical shock, as in there was a pandemic, we closed things. It wasn't an economic realignment. So I actually think we are overdue for the usual 10 to 12-year global economic readjustment, I guess you call it. And yes, we haven't had that period of three or four years we've been, been paying down the debt. We've been massively increasing it. And we're, you know, one of the smaller, most exposed. So I think it's a huge concern. And, you know, uh, we're getting a bit geeky here, but the International Monetary Fund surveyed 160 countries on their growth prospects. And we weren't last, Cam. We were 159th. We were just ahead of Equatorial Guinea. Which is a which is an economic basket case. Well, I don't yeah. know it is. I just sort of like assume it. It kind of looks like it is, yeah. you know. But there's 158 countries ahead of us on those In rankings. Of their forecast growth. Yeah, I don't think we've got any growth forecast. And I certainly can't see it continuing if the Labour Green coalition continues on. I think it's just going to get materially worse. And I think Grant Robertson is going to go down in history as perhaps one of the worst finance ministers we've ever had. Well, of course, it won't just be a Labour Green coalition. It's been 15 months since Labour Greens looked like they could possibly form a government. The only way Labour gets re-elected is they will have to rely on both the Greens and Te Party Māori. And, you know, let's just say I doubt that's going to be a more fiscally responsible government. No, it'll be insane. So just to round out our talk about the wasted vote and where it's going, your advice to people that are considering uh, voting for 
a anti-establishment or freedom type party is what? Well, generally, if they're consistently polling below 3%, it's very, very, very unlikely they will make it. And if you want to change the government, if you want your vote to count, you need to vote for a party that is either well above the 5% threshold or based on history, very likely to make that threshold. Or, of course, that they're very likely to win an electorate seat. And don't look at just one poll. Don't trust polls leaked by parties themselves. Look at the average of the public polls. Yeah, so you've got to take into account the Roy Morgan, the Taxpayers Union poll, One News News Hub, and the rare polls that the New Zealand Herald and stuff do. But if you look at all of those And polls, Talbot Moles. Yeah, like Talbot. Only when they're public, though, because they like leaking them when they're um, good news for the Labour Party. They do. But, uh, but, yeah, if you can get the public polls that come out with that, average those, track that yourself and have a look at the trend. I, that's what I always say, look at the trend. And uh, just a final note, I guess, I'm seeing now the usual pattern starting to emerge in polling if you ignore 2020. The usual pattern is the larger parties slip away towards the conclusion of the campaign and the, and some of the minor parties uh, just come up a bit, and that's what it's starting to look like now. Is that yeah, we've certainly feeling? seen that because it's easier during the campaign for the minor parties to start to get more publicity. They're spending on billboards, et cetera. Mm. Um, so we're certainly seeing that. Other thing we're thinking about is people keep thinking it's only, I'm not sure if it's like six or seven weeks till the election, but I believe the election starts on the 3rd of October. That's when yeah. advanced voting starts. The election is not the 14th of October. That's just when they count the votes. So in terms of persuading people who to vote for. They've got to do it before October the 3rd. Only less than four weeks left to really persuade people. The last two weeks of the campaign is actually get out the vote. So if you're looking at the polls, there's only around three, three and a half more weeks of polling to focus on because once people start voting, we're going to be having the results set. I mean, yeah, of course, you still have half vote on election day. What well, might not even be half this year. It might be a third. This is going to be a tricky one for you, David. But do you agree with Winston Peters? I can almost hear the no coming out of your mouth. <laughs> yeah. Do you agree with Winston Peters that there shouldn't be any polling once voting starts? No, and here's why. Winston's long, long said this. First of all, you could ban publishing of polls, but look, social media age strides in effect. Everyone would then just be leaking the polls, rumouring the polls. It would actually work. You'd make the political parties more powerful because they would actually still be doing internal polling, so they would know what's happening. And also you've got overseas polling companies. There's a Aussie firm that polls for a British newspaper. How do you stop them, basically, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think what Winston's getting at is polls can be self-fulfilling prophecies. And if there's bad polls out there, they can damage a party. If a poll says you're at 1% and you're at 4.5%, people then might not vote for you. Yeah. General advice, again, is don't cherry-pick the polls. Uh, look at the averages there. I've actually studied the election results since 1996 for every poll and every party. The mm. average error tends to be around 1.1%. So they're not – yeah, in New Zealand, they've actually been reasonably accurate. So that's a big difference if you're a small party, but it's not so di not so big uh, uh, an issue if you're the Labour Party or the National Party. No, well, one of the things in New Zealand, because we do have MMP, is a 1% polling error is a one-seat difference. Mm. In Aussie, a 1% change in the polls could be 10 marginal seats. In the wow. US, 1% change in the polls could be 50 electoral votes. And in the UK, 1% can be... You know, 40 electorates. So in New Zealand, what's critical is if the polls are accurate around will a party make the threshold for that's like make or break. Yes. But you know, whether national gets 36 or 37 percent is important to national, it may be important to forming the government. But 
it doesn't make a huge impact in terms of is there a vote for change. You know, we know that Labor got 50% last election and they're now polling somewhere in the high 20s to low 30s. So there's no dispute they have lost a massive amount of support. Yeah, exactly. And 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 that's the thing that the that's where the blood is running right now is the Labour Party has bled away nearly half of their support that they had in 2020, which is pretty spectacular. Before, normally losing more than 10% of your support is regarded as a bad result. To lose 40%, you know, let's say 1996 National got 34%. In yeah. 1999, they lost office on 30%. So they lost around 11% of their support only. Uh, 11, you know, 4% yeah, yeah. out of 34. Helen Clark, I think she left office on 34%. She got 40% the time before. She So they lost in 2008 around 15% of their support. We've got government that got the only majority ever under MMP and they're actually now the lowest polling party in government in the history of MMP too. No, no, you know, we've not had a governing party before drop into the 20s. Normally that's where oppositions are, yeah. let alone one that was at 50%. And, and in my last poll for Taxpayers Union, what was interesting is they're losing it everywhere. They're losing some to National, some directly to ACT, some to the Greens, some to Te Pahi Māori, and some to New Zealand First. And that's, again, quite unusual too. Normally, you sort of people tend to think national loses to Labour or Labour to national, but Labour's losing to everyone. Yeah, so the political cancer, this election, really. Yeah, but tell you what, though. They're still in it, though. Every poll still has the centre right only at sort of 61 to 65 seats. Uh, is more likely than not there's a change of government, but it's far from a done thing. If, um, I've actually been looking back at the past MMP elections. John Key, everyone thinks he won landslides. He generally only had 61, 62, mm. 63 seat majorities. So what if we had to pick a year that this, the feeling of the polling is giving you, is this a, a 1990 landslide like Jim Bolger, or is it a 1996 with the minor parties surging up? Or I think it's it, a 2002. Up until oh, a month yeah. ago, I thought it was more 2005, which is National and Labour, neck and neck, et cetera, really tight race. And, and I may change this. In 2002, that's when National collapsed its vote and both New Zealand First and United Future sprung up and got well over 5%, mm. et cetera. The difference here is it's happening to Labour and they're in government, not opposition. Yeah. But that seems to be what what is happening. Like, Tea Party Māori and some of the polling I'm seeing, they're actually getting up at 4 or 5%, et cetera. New Zealand First has obviously been up in the polls the last two, three months. Well, your good friend Bill English might get the monkey off his back of the 20.92%. Well, I was going to say I haven't seen any polls that has Labour at 21, but Roy Morgan does have them at 24. So, yeah. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Act in that poll was only 6% behind, so someone pointed out if they can take 3% more off Labour, then the leaders' debate should be between Chris Luxon and David Seymour. <laughs> I think Winston would have something to say about that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for explaining uh, the effect of the wasted vote and a little bit extra about polling. Thanks a lot for coming on The Crunch. Thanks, Cam. Enjoyed it. No worries. David certainly shared a few insights there. It's amazing that Labour's support is bleeding out and it's unheard of that a party would shed 40 to 50% of their support in just three years. Governments have changed on swings much lower than that. Don't forget to send comments on David's interview to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater, right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio. Masoko Ganaha is a brave independent journalist from Japan who is driven by a desire to wake up the Japanese public to the dangers of globalism and the designs of organizations like the WEF. I'm very privileged to welcome her to The Crunch. 
thank you very much for having me. Now you've got a bit of a, a reputation around the world and have become a viral sensation and also because of your fierce independence in your reporting. Now, the viral video was when you managed to doorstep Klaus Schwab from the WEF. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Because most of our uh, our listeners won't have been aware that you confronted Klaus Schwab at Davos in the freezing cold. And we've had uh, Avi Yemeni and Ezra Levant on and, and Rukshan Fernando, and I know you've spoken to Rukshan in the past. Uh, so just to, if you can just explain what it was like at Davos and what it's like being an independent journalist in that environment. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so that was my first time uh, covering Davos uh, this January. Mm. Uh, to give you the basic uh, atmosphere information in Japan, many of your viewers are knowledgeable about what is happening in the world. Mm. It's not targeting just your country, but same thing happening all over the world. But not so many Japanese have woken up. So I'm trying to wake Japanese people up. And when I talk about Davos or World Economic Forum in Japan, first of all, people have not heard of these terms. Yeah. So I wanted to I wanted to realize that this is not just a conspiracy theory, but it is happening conspiracy and we are the target. So I wanted to take real footage and that those people are existing people. <laughs> and I wanted to I myself wanted to learn what is really happening and not just by reading books or watching videos, interviews, but I wanted to talk to the people who are participating. That was the original intent and i i got lucky i think and i uh, i got the information about where Klaus schwab the chairman of world economic forum is going to be after these um meetings uh, so i decided to wait outside for three hours wow. where there was a japan night it's a very famous event during those people who attend Davos conference. So I thought maybe this year he's going to show up this event also. So I decided to wait and here he was. <laughs> Three hours in the freezing cold and uh, waiting to catch Klaus Schwab. And what did he do when you confronted him, when you stuck a camera in his face and asked him questions? Uh, first of all, he just rushed to his car with two securities and one, I think she was a secretary or I, I don't know what's her title, but there was three person around him. And so I tried to stop him to ask questions. So I have a bad habit asking questions if I can ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Chairman Schwab, uh, may I ask you a question? And first he ignored, but because I kept asking, he stopped and actually turned to me and he asked me, which media are you from? Then I said, I'm on an independent media. Yeah. Then he changed his attitude and he just pretends that we didn't have conversation and he just took off to the car. But then I kept following. Kept following and kept, uh, kept recording. And that's the thing with these people, isn't it? That they want to dictate how we should live, how our government should control our citizens. And they're not keeping this a secret, are they? No, they they say it. <laughs> <laughs> they say it and they do it. Yes. And you and... look at and so so you're trying to this must be very difficult for you from within Japan where the vast majority of people in Japan are compliant with government orders and government regulation and business rules and those sorts of things. And you are becoming a very loud voice saying to people, open your eyes, take your fingers out of your ears and start listening to what these people are saying and doing. Uh, yes, we have sort of like a culture. We call it what? It's if you write it in uh, English, it's W A W. Yep. Harmony. 
So uh, if you are to observe Japanese people's behavior, a common factor is to we are to maintain this harmony. Wa. Mm. So that leaves us susceptible to this uh, totalitarian dictatorship. Right. So until now, uh, until, until recently, I was thinking that saying we need to have a human rights, it was like a left wing thing. That's yeah. what I was feeling. That a lot of many Japanese conservatives still think. But it's not just that. They are actually, there is no right and left political um, battle. It's a staged. So we need to realize and our fundamental uh, rights are really under threat. So, and those, those rights are universal. I mean, in New Zealand, we don't have a word like wa, right? What what we have is an a prevailing attitude where people go along with what everybody else is doing so they can get along with what everybody else is doing. And again, it, it made us very susceptible to totalitarianism where we had the harshest lockdowns, where we had a government that gloated and laughed. You know, just Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said when she introduced vaccine passports and uh, separated society between those who were vaccinated and those who were not, and she was challenged by a journalist and asked, aren't you creating a two classes of society? And she said, yep, that's exactly what it is. Yep. And she grinned and smiled. And she didn't even realize at the time, I don't think, what she was saying, but she was a, you know, a socialist. She's a hardcore socialist, was advocating for the creation of two classes of, of citizens. Have you got a similar kind of behavior like that happening in Japan as well that you're seeking to expose people to? Um, uh, I wanted to uh, make it clear if I understand your, your question. So mm. you're asking if there is any politician like you, in your country that there are people who are making classes? Yes. Oh, they don't do it in an obvious way that happened in your country yet, but they don't say it, but they are doing it in, in Japan, I think. Those people who attend Davos, for example, Taro Kono, he's one of a, a minister. Mm -hmm. He's now a minister for di digital. He says one thing, but he doesn't follow it. He just enforces us and he does not take accountability. Uh, for instance, before being pre uh, minister for digital, he was in charge of vaccine distribution in Japan. Right. Yeah, and he was like all the people who are saying the vax is very dangerous. They are the conspiracy theorists and they are the demagogue. But after we discovered in Japan that many people are hurt and many people have lost their lives, he mm. just kept mouth shut. And what he mentioned after being the minister of digital, he said, "It's not my job anymore, so I'm not going to talk about it." That's what he <laughs> said. So uh, he's doing it and he's saying it, but um, he doesn't take accountability. And the media in Japan is letting this happen. Because of their silence. Yes. Plus, they are part of this ecosystem in the world <laughs> to <laughs> make us kettles. Yeah. Um, so you've got a very difficult job in Japan as an independent journalist. You're being challenged not only by the politicians who don't want to be held to account, but also by the media who have become the mouthpieces of the politicians, and then by the citizens of Japan who are used to doing what they're told despite the evidence in front of them that's obvious, you know, like the vaccine injuries, the the, the deaths that are occurring, all of those sorts of things. And, and you know, I find it ironic too in that, you know, there was a treatment that was available called ivermectin, which was discovered by a Japanese scientist. And yet even in Japan, ivermectin wasn't available as a treatment. 
you know, many people have imported by themselves, including myself. <laughs> <laughs> and and I did the same. Our government banned ivermectin for two years in New Zealand, and you couldn't get it unless you did what you did and what I did, and we brought it in ourselves. And uh, I think it's a crime that's been committed against you know, the people of both of our countries by the politicians doing this, but it's only brave people like yourself that are drawing attention to it. And uh, you must feel lonely at times doing what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, uh, since I started to travel around the world to find out what is happening and uh, what should I say, research on this globalist, mm. Uh, so many good things happened to me. Yeah. One of it is including finding the people who are standing up, like yeah. yourself. Yes. And so I think I've been making best friends in this couple recent years. <laughs> and they're, pe they're people that believe like you do as well. I mean, you've spoken to Rukshan Fernando. He, he was a guy who was a wedding uh, photographer before. COVID, and now he's an independent journalist, and Avi Yamini and Ezra Levant from Rebel News and, and other independent journalists that are standing up, that are standing on the shoulders of brave people to hold politicians, and in worse, people like Klaus Schwab, who are unelected, uh, that have this organization with billions of dollars available to them, and are essentially brainwashing whole populations. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, like you mentioned, brave journalist from Rebel News. I yes. met uh, Ezra Levant yeah. and uh, Avi Yamini uh, in Davos. Actually, they are the one who inspired me to go to Davos because the, the year before, they did reporting from Davos and yes. I saw it on uh, online. And I did not know until then that we can actually go there and confront those people. Yes. So uh, you, you asked me if I feel lonely doing this kind of work. I do. Mm, I don't feel loneliness, actually, because by doing this kind of work, actually, I uh, created good human relationship with all, people all over the world. So I, I feel myself I'm in a war, like we are in a war, not just a political argument or any kind of event. It, we are in a war, I, I think. So in a war, we find good friends relatively easily. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to introduce you one book that yes. I've recently been reading. Uh, I don't have it right now. It's, I thought it's in the bookshelf, but it's called The... Uh, Loneliness of totalitarianism. Yeah. Weaponization of loneliness of totalitarianism, which is written by a American researcher. And she used to be a CIA agent researching yeah. on Soviet Union and the propaganda that happened in those uh, eras. And she's analyzing how our loneliness it's not like our weakness of loneliness, but our mecha mind mechanism. We are not made to be lonely. We are made to be with other human beings to communicate. That's the healthy uh, environment. So she explaining how those globalists and those people are using our mechanism to manipulate us by using this loneliness. So if I are asked about whether I feel lonely or not, I try every day to make myself not lonely because right. that's one of the fight or one of the technique that we protect ourselves and our society. And also, if you were to think about the situation where one victim is tortured by to totalitarianist people. Yes. Everything they do, one thing in common is to take your hope away so that you feel lonely. Then they have a chance 
to brainwash you or to make you into a cattle. So I always try not to feel lonely. And <laughs> that's the part of fight I'm doing every day. Yeah, that, so that's that's the book by Stella Marabito, yeah? Uh, yes. Yes, The Weaponization of Loneliness, How Tyrants Stoke Our Fear of Isolation to Silence, Divide, and Conquer. And that's exactly what was done in New Zealand under COVID with lockdown rules. You know, we had our prime minister come on television and tell people not to talk to their neighbours. She actually said that. Do not talk to your neighbours. Stay at home. Talk to no one. Only listen to us. We're the one source of truth. That's what she said. That's what they did. And this author, you're saying, from the CIA, says this is a strategy. This is a tactic. And they do that to control us. So yeah. you, So what you're saying then to people that are listening or people who are watching your channels or uh, looking at your journalism is be brave, stand up, and don't be silent. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and, and in doing so, you will no longer be lonely because you'll be surrounded with other people who think the same way. Mm. Yes, if we do not resist in a way, we actively seek for our ally or friends, then you will be automatically be isolated. Mm. That is how our society is structured now. And uh, I am now um, kind of like protecting my country, Japan, from Japanese government. Yeah. <laughs> this awareness came to my mind when I experienced a isolation process when I came flew back from other country back to Japan. As soon as I arrived, I arrived to the airport, they tested as if we are all <laughs> dangerous people. <laughs> and then if you get negative, which the test itself is not reliable, but mm. they, it's like we are in a waiting room as if we feel like, are we guilty or not? Like no. you are guilty until proven innocent. <laughs> that mentality. And when I got a negative test result, I was happy, but <laughs> I felt like, oh, they are playing my mind. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you get negative or positive. If you flew out of the country, you are to stay in a ho de designated hotel by the government yeah. for a certain days. And I was at a very famous uh, luxurious hotel that yeah. they provided me. But then I experienced, uh, I realized, uh, until then, I thought Japan is better than other countries. <laughs> like we yeah. don't do lockdowns and our government are not crazy as others. But then I realized they're taking this procedure to make mm. us isolated, as exactly described in the book that yeah. I have read. Then I realized, oh, my government, Japanese government, is also ha have became the part of this big globalist machinery yeah. to control us. So that was a mm, turning point for me to become even more concerned. And you've kept up doing that because you're now standing up against the government. You're also going and exposing these globalists and their methods of control and their designs, because there's warnings out there about what they are up to if you look at places like Sri Lanka. And the WEF provided an economic plan for Sri Lanka, which collapsed the economy. And now the Sri Lankan people are revolting against that, and the government's not knowing what to do about it. We'll never see that happen in Japan, though, will we? Um, at this point, I think anything can happen because mm. that's how much they are capable of. Like they are so deep into our society in many ways. So I think we have to be ready for anything. I've learned that if we are surprised by an event, 
Mm. Or if you are saying, oh, I cannot believe this, that means the paradigm in our mind is not correct if you are surprised by the, those phenomena. Yeah. So I I think we have to be ready for anything that can be ha- happening. What's Japan's view on uh, centralized bank digital currencies? Because that's mean, a WEF plan. Uh, you mean the Japanese government or yes. the people? The Japanese oh. government. What is the government saying about uh, centralized bank digital currencies? And then the second question is, what do the Japanese people think about that? Uh, okay. So I'm not closely following the, into the details, but uh, basically it's it's sad to say, but Japanese government is in a way, it, we are not independent country. <laughs> uh, we Our government is a branch of uh, US government. Right. <laughs> so we cannot oppose anything that they do or they impose. So at this point, if U.S. government or WEF or the yes. globalist organization are pointing to one direction, then we are just to follow. Our government is just to follow. Right. That's the situation. So in terms of this digital currency, there are no argument about opposing it. But our government is trying to make us ready for those environment. They are disguising as, oh, we need to create system so that we can prevent fraud or international money laundering. Yeah. So I've been getting a lot of, not myself, but a lot of the banks are now requiring all the paperwork and we call it my number. It's yeah. a number that given from the government to each uh, citizen in Japan. Yeah. So that personal ID number was created and the number is not connected to the bank but at this point it's voluntary so i'm not giving my number <laughs> but <laughs> I, i'm sure they are going to create environment that so that we have to give it in order to live in a society so that's what i'm trying to warn people but it's uh going forward one by one yeah that's that's what they do isn't it it's little tiny steps towards totalitarianism that the vast majority of people won't or don't notice until they finally wake up and it's too late. Mm, yes. And about LGBT ideology, that was one huge, uh, what should I say, crisis that happened recently in Japan. Mm. And I think that was occasion many Japanese people woke up, but kind of like it was too late because the law has been passed already. Yeah. And in Japan now, there's a law. Uh, it's about understanding LGBT people. Right. They say we have to understand so that we can have a I- inclusive society. I don't like this word, but they use this word. And what they're saying is that we have to affirm people's uh, I- illusion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that's a good description. We have to affirm people's illusion. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And because they put this in legislation, now our tax is going to be used to indoctrinate our children in school system. And now if you come to Japan, you see a lot of uh, rainbow sign mm. on bathrooms and where I live, uh, it's uh, near Tokyo. Mm. This place called Saitama Prefecture, the governor have signed a law. Its goal is to educate, put education um, curriculum in, in schools 100%. So they're going to do this in all the schools in this prefecture. And so that kind of things have uh, happening. And what I was going to say is that what I mean by we are not independent is the ambassador, American ambassador to Japan mm. was advocating strongly that Japan should pass this law. 
and he invited a lot of the politicians to the embassy. And despite a lot of politicians' opposition, or despite a lot of Japanese people's opposition, Japanese government passed this law, even ignoring the uh, what should I call the the vote, the wishes of the voters. Uh, oh. yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. And so they just ignore the principle of the majority. Mm. So that happened under the pressure of foreign politicians. Mm. Uh, by seeing this phenomenon, we once again realized, even if we say we are independent country and we are good allies with the United States, but what is really happening is that we are just following the orders. And I want to emphasize that I'm not talking about anti-American people. Right. We are talking about the government which is dictating the United States. And I have many friends in the United States, the conservative people, they call it the current government, occupied government of the United States. Yeah. So American people even don't see the legitimacy of the government in the United States. So in this sense, we have same enemy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, enemy is a strong word, but... Uh, when you look at what they're doing against the wishes of the voters, it's perhaps not strong to call them the enemy of the people because they're not, they don't listen to us. They're not listening to the voters. They're not listening to independent journalists. They're working together with other media to suppress independent views. And, you know, I admire journalists like yourself in countries like Japan where the culture is to comply. For you to stand up, be brave, and say, I'm not complying, and here's why. And we need more people like you out there uh, doing independent journalism so that more people can understand that the politicians are not our friends, even though they like to pretend they are. They're not. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh... I do a lot of uh, interviews and reporting, but what motivates me the most is a story I heard from my relative uh, back in the day when Japan was fighting against the United States. Uh, there are many young people who sacrifice themselves to protect the future. Mm. I'm not talking about the war it was good or bad. I'm not. To I'm talking about the mentality or the yes. people who what should I say, believed in our my, ourselves, like future generation. Yep. And they put their life aside and then they dedicated their life to the country and uh, offsprings like myself. And I have a relative who was 18 years old at, the, at that point and she decided to help the soldier to treat as a nurse. And my grandmother, she met her. And she, my grandmother, trying to stop her going to the war because yeah. she knew that she's not going to come back. But when she, my grandmother said it, then this lady said, uh, there are so many things that I want to do, but it is my sincere hope that I can do something to the country. And she never came back. Since I heard that story when I was little, I have realized we are now living in a... Um, even though we are living in this globalist ruling world, but mm. we are living in a very good society and we have very good, uh, comfortable house and very good service, civilized world. But this is not free. No. It's because of the people like my relative who sacrifice for the society for the future. So I'm just getting the merits. And I, I don't want to be the ones to pollute. I, I need to take part in a hard fight because it's continuing. So, yeah. even, so, yeah, so I cannot ignore. It's, it's not sincere. It's not how we live. <laughs> no, I can see you're very passionate about that. And, you know, I love to see that, that people are passionate about what they do, and you're passionate about your journalism and you using your journalism, your 
intelligence, your words, your you know your videos to fight for freedom for a better world. And uh, it's so heartening to see that there are people like you out there that are standing up. And we need to expose not just your own citizens, but the citizens of all countries, including New Zealand, to those views. And, and that's why I wanted to interview you on this, so that people in New Zealand who have been fighting for freedom can know that there are other people around the world that are standing up and are as passionate about freedom and rights as you are. And like, you know, I, I come from a conservative background and I used to think human rights and all of those things was a left wing perspective until someone took my rights away. And then I decided this is too important. And that's what I'm getting from you, from talking with you, that you feel that so strongly that you're not going to give up. You're going to keep on fighting and you're going to keep on telling those stories that are important, not only to the citizens of Japan, but to the citizens of the world. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great uh, opportunity for me. And uh, I especially would like to express my highest respect to the people in New Zealand because your fight is very important and it was one of the most severe fights. But you are standing up and you're showing us hope and the importance of uh, keep fight fighting. So I cannot express my respect en enough. Uh, I just really uh, admire. Thank you so much for that. And uh, look... I'm sure our listeners uh, are going to start following you as well uh, on social media and, and everywhere else that you put your stories out there. And I, I really appreciate the time that you've taken today to talk to my listeners so that they can know that there are people out there outside of New Zealand that are fighting just as hard as they are. And I appreciate your time today. And thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. I got uh, power today. <laughs> <from> <laughs> you too. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Masako. I appreciate your time. And uh, we'll have to talk again sometime. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. What a brave and inspiring story. Masako Ganaha is certainly someone well worth following. Add her to those you follow to show your support for brave, independent journalists so that they know they are not alone. Fill that mailbag with comments about Masoko by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy right here on RCR. Would you like to be a part of Reviving Honest Media? At RCR, we're on a mission to do just that. We report on critical, censored stories and hold those in positions of power to account. As Paul Brennan says, it's a good mission. Now there's an easy way to support RCR and at the same time receive some amazing benefits. Our Foundation Membership Club is here. As a member, you'll enjoy a host of exclusive benefits, including a daily bite-sized news digest, a backstage pass to RCR, and discounted merchandise. Find out all you need to know about our Foundation membership now at www.realitycheck.radio. Simon Lusk is a seasoned political consultant and an expert on campaigning. With the advent of Labour's nasty negative campaigning, I thought I'd get him back on the crunch to discuss in depth how negative campaigning can be successful, and we will rate the New Zealand attempts at negative campaigning. Welcome, Simon. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, so it's all big news this week after the CTU has um, run attack ads in the Herald, and we had, of course, David Seymour running attack ads against Winston Peters, and the media have sort of woken up to the this revelation that there's such a thing as negative campaigning. But you and I, have uh, we've run our own negative campaigns in the past, and it's nothing new for us. So I thought we'd share with the RCR listeners your views on negative campaigning and whether it's worthwhile and effective. Oh, well, the first thing is, is absolutely it is extremely worthwhile and it is very effective. It is um, 
a crucial part of the um, the campaigner's toolbook, and and you're basically negligent if you're not willing to use it. Um, it's you know it's it's a, it's a proven and well tested method in the rest of the world, especially in the US, where the campaigning has actually got a whole lot cleaner. In in the um, 1800s, they used to uh, put out absolutely slanderous brochures about their opponents that were just made up. Um, now it, it at least has a degree of truth in it. Um, and it really just works, and it works because it emphasises what um, people tend to think anyway about a politician, um, and it usually works because it's it's truthful. Um, you can't say stuff, stuff about someone else that isn't truthful. You get nailed in defamation. So you've mm. got to be um, truthful. And, and the, there's research, and, and I'm not sure how contemporary research goes, but it's saying it's four times more truthful than the biographical pieces that politicians put out about themselves, which are, you know, basically puff pieces and bullshit. If you're going to run a negative campaign, you've got to tell the truth about someone. Yeah, exactly. So, and, so how come New Zealand is backwards, really, in coming forwards on negative campaigning? Uh, there's a series of reasons, but the biggest one is the um, lack of professionalism in New Zealand politics. We're a very amateur place. The money spent here is not high. The quality of our um, our politicians is not high. They don't fundraise properly, and then they don't run decent campaigns based on having good data. And you know, they, our, our mate Farad should be involved in just about every campaign, telling people how to use data properly. They don't, you know, nationals will, oh, we're blue dot. Well, they never have a get out the vote. Obama spent t uh, $100 million in 2012 on his data alone, and that was just to do the get out the vote. We're, we're amateur. Um, and, oh, we've all got to be nice to each other. Well, well, you know, that's not the real world, and we'd be a far better place if we actually emphasise some of the, the failings of, of some political parties. Although you do have to be a bit careful about it. I mean, the, um, the classic example of where negative campaigning didn't work was Pauline Hanson in Australia, where when she first came on the scene, um, she'd say something outrageous, everyone would go nuts about it, and her poll rating would go up. And at, at one point, one of the senior ministers in the Australian government came out and said, look, we're all just going to stop talking about Pauline Hanson. If we ignore her, her poll rating will go down. Um, and and that message got um, uh, widely published. No politicians talked about her. And, you know, being Australia, they put her in jail as well. But um, she got let out because the conviction was dodgy. But they absolutely hammered her by ignoring her. So that, that wasn't a negative campaign. It was no campaign. Just ignore her. So some of the time, ignoring is better than negative. Well, that's what I couldn't work out with David Seymour and the ACT Party's attacks on Winston Peters. They actually had a nice photo of Winston with a smile on his face and a quote on the billboards that he could easily have said. And so it ended up looking like a New Zealand First ad instead of an ACT Party ad. Yeah, and and I think your criticism is probably a bit generous. Whoever put that ad up really needs to be punished severely because there was ambiguity in it. Now, if they wanted to get the message out that Winston was uh, a, a risk or something, they needed to be much clearer. I mean, I looked at that ad and, and a whole lot of people said to me, oh, has Winston got billboards up in central Auckland? Oh, I, I don't know. Um, and they sent me that one, I had a look at it, and it's an act ad, and I couldn't tell immediately. It was it was a very inept ad. Ineptness in politics is the undoing of many politicians. Unfortunately, we have an ineptocracy. Yeah, yeah, we do. We're just not professional at all about it. And, you know, we've, we've seen a series of people that wanted to be prime minister thinking they would get there like Jacinda by being lovely people and they just weren't and they got hammered. Uh, and, you know, that's most opposition leaders. Mm. It, so in the US, they campaign on, on uh, with negative ads especially, on the failures or, or poor results on policy, they use the record of the politician, don't they, extensively? Yeah, and not only that, they um, so so they hold people to account, but they also um, 
force people to vote on stuff that they know won't pay in their electorate. So there's a whole lot of congressional votes that are absolutely meaningless. It's never going to get uh, into law, but it's one side wants the other side to say, well, or to vote on something that they know isn't popular. And, you know, the, the classic example at the moment is is really tough abortion laws are very, very unpopular, even with the Republican voters. So the Democrats are trying to get line people up to put in a six-week abortion ban because they know they can win votes off it. Um, if it's in Congress, Congress has no ability to change abortion laws, um, but they can vote on abortion laws and it just won't go anywhere. Um, and, you know, it's the uh, impeach, talking impeachment on, on um, Biden, there's a whole lot of Republicans who, who have districts that voted for Biden are very worried about an impeachment because it could cost them their seats. Um, and you know that, that I, I don't think that Biden's team will be that they, they don't want to be impeached, but they will be able to make a play for those 23 seats by saying these idiots voted for impeachment when Biden hadn't done anything wrong and was trying to fix the economy. So let's get rid of them. And you know that that's a, a setup that is something that I'm sure there's plenty of Democratic strategists are ready to go in those 23 seats with. Mm. Um, a lot of the negative uh, campaigning in the US seems to involve uh, personalities and flaws in their personality. And, and I guess one of the most recent ones that I can remember was when uh, John Kerry was standing and uh, the Swift Vote Boat Veterans for Truth came out and launched an attack ad against uh, against John Kerry. Uh, based on his, you know, alleged service in Vietnam, uh, and seriously impinged uh, his ability to 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 get anywhere on that. Yeah, although uh, the Republicans did walk away from that because mm. uh, there were a whole lot of veterans who were offended by it. Uh, the the rules around um, uh, Purple Hearts so are you, you basically just need to bleed. So yes, he was. Um, he, he won a Purple Heart, and were, I think after three injuries or three Purple Hearts, you you get taken out of service, and they weren't major injuries. Mm. But I, I'm pretty sure that uh, George W. Bush came out and said, look, this has got to stop, which uh, sometimes does happen, where mm. it, it's gone a bit overboard. The far more effective attack on Kerry, and, and I'm sure you're going to share this ad, was the, the one of him windsurfing and, and changing direction. And yeah. that is just an absolutely – yeah, Kerry voted for this – and then he voted against it, and then he voted for it again. Yeah. And, and they run through about half a dozen things where he's just changing direction on his windsurf, or changing direction on his votes. And yeah, that that was a wonderful ad. Um, and it, it, you know, the, the flip flopping of Kerry was something that they used to define him. I'm George W. Bush, and I approve this message. In which direction would John Kerry lead? Kerry voted for the Iraq War, opposed it, supported it, and now opposes it again. He bragged about voting for the $87 billion to support our troops before he voted against it. He voted for education reform and now opposes it. He claims he's against increasing Medicare premiums, but voted five times to do so. John Kerry, whichever way the wind blows. And that's where it comes down to, isn't it? Because elections elections are are effectively a referendum on the on the government. Yeah, or a choice between leaders. So you you know, mm. at the moment, National really want this to be a referendum on the government because the government is about the worst in living memory, um, if not the worst ever. They've just managed to fail on everything and National haven't prosecuted that case. And all Labour of God is Hipkins is way more likable than um, than Luxon and people are, are just not sure about Luxon and so they want it to be a choice between Hipkins and, and Luxon mm. and National want it to be a referendum that it, you know if, if COVID came back and we're all locked down and we still had the election and Luxon couldn't get out it'd probably help him like it helped Biden yeah. um, but you know the Hip, Hipkins in my view has made a terrible mistake in um, having the debates head-to-head -head debate with um, Luxon on the 12th of October, because at least half of people will have voted by then and the, the election's over. Um, he should have been demanding three debates with Luxon starting now and, you know, really emphasising the difference between the two because it's, it's, there's not much else Labor has. Well, that, that's the thing, isn't it? They can't run on their record. Uh, 
I mean, they haven't delivered 100,000 Kiwi build houses. They haven't planted a billion trees. They haven't materially reduced child poverty. They haven't built the the uh, light rail to the airport. They haven't built the bridge across Auckland Harbour. There's a whole lot of things they haven't done. They can hardly run on their on their record. But on the other hand, we're not seeing uh, the National Party prosecuting the government for their failures. I mean, sure, they're doing a little bit on crime, and uh, you know, Erica Stanford's been uh, doing sterling work about school truancy. But 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 the massive amounts of waste. I mean, just last week there was the education. Uh, Ministry of Education having millions and millions of of masks in storage costing something like $27,000 a month to store, and they're about to expire. You've got the rat tests, half a billion dollars on rat tests, and we're not seeing the, the, gov- the, the opposition prosecuting these failures. And, you know, I think that we we both acknowledge that Helen Clark is probably the best politician in our lifetime. She's just wonderful. And I think if we remember back to the pressure she had Chipley's government under from about 97 to 99, Mm. they were, everyone just thought that Chipley was hopeless and her government was useless. And, you know, that was the, my, my wonderful polls professor said to me, you know, that, that when you're prosecuting the case against as the opposition, You've got to make the government fear going into the House. And I'm sure that the National Party didn't enjoy going into the House when Helen Clark was just smashing them for their continued incompetence. And I don't see Labor going into the House in fear. And they should be because they've got a disgraceful record. And I'm not talking about the stuff that your listeners care about. I'm just talking about the big stuff like the 100,000 houses, the light Mm. rail, you know, the, the school truancy those things are just everyone can see that it's terrible you know it's just and and instead of uh, like that that should have been the last probably two years national should have just been pounding them in the house so they didn't want to go in there i mean the, the probably the best uh pounding that we can remember is when lockwood smith was prosecuting tito philip field and yeah. helen clark yeah. was not enjoying going into the house every day to answer questions about a dodgy minister, and and Lockwood did a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, and you know the the even better example is, um, and probably the best example of an opposition prosecuting a government is is Tony Abbott just completely rinsed the Labor Party and almost got back into power after three years. And mm. you know that that was just perfect. He, he and his slogans were really simple. It was a great campaign. You knew exactly what he was standing for and it just emphasized that labor really weren't fit to run the country and if it hadn't been for the three independents in very right-wing seats signing up with with labor he would have got there um in uh 2010 not 2013 and you know that that's the model but uh, yeah you know helen clark was as good as as tony abbott if not she was much better as prime minister and you know, that, that's the kind of thing that a true negative campaign would have been, just highlighting the truth about Labor. And mm. every day in the House, just like, don't ask Hip, uh, Hipkins any questions. Ask the useless education minister what's happened to the, the all the truancy or the, the even more useless transport minister about all the potholes or why he's wasted so much money on light rail and it's never going to get built. Um you know, the only question to ask the leader is, do you have confidence in all your ministers after you've demonstrated that they, they can't run a bath, let alone a ministry? Well, that, I mean, that's the thing I could never understand, uh, you know, in the early days of the Ardern uh, regime, is that, you know, various leaders from Bill English to Simon Bridges to Todd Muller, um, they all just stood there and asked questions of Ardern. And I I just was staggered that they continued to do that. And she was competent enough answering questions to bat them away easily. And they would have been far better to to do exactly what you said, ignore Ardern so she sits there. She can't flap her arms and flap her gums. She can't answer any questions. Uh, same with Robertson, same with Hipkins. Ignore them and go after the dullards and the dolts that are within within the ministry. And just well, yeah. just harass yeah. them and break them, and and we did see that though with Melissa Lee uh, when she went after Claire Curran, and it wrecked her, absolutely and, wrecked her. 
basically, you know, for the life of me, I can't understand how that useless prick from Teatre 2 managed to stay in. You know, useless Phil. What's his name? Twi- but Twi- he- Mr. Twifford, as um, Stephen Joyce used to call him. I mean, the, he, I think he was trying to uh, build the light rail and 100,000 houses and he didn't get close to doing any of them. I mean, I would have had him up on both of those every day, just incessantly. Just make, And Labor's uh, backbenchers would have been cowering in fear after a few weeks of that because they just know he hasn't got any answers. It would have been simple. Every week you say you get the housing minister, how many Kiwi build houses have been built this week? Yeah. The answer the yeah. answer would have been week after week after week, none, none, yeah. none. Yep. Yeah. So and, and then of course that leads into the ability to run attack ads and run negative campaigning based on their abject failure at, you know, on their record. And that's that's really the perfect areas, isn't it, that you can attack people on is their record because it's undeniable. These are the facts. Yeah, uh, there's also a, um, a degree of uh, of theatre and a degree of um, of just emphasising what the instinctive feel about someone is. And you know, the, the the first really negative campaign ad in the modern era was Johnson's Daisy ad um, mm. when he was he was running against Goldwater in in '64. And the daisy ad, which I'm sure you're going to share, is is a little girl plucking uh, the leaves off a daisy, and um, and an atomic bomb going off because um, Goldwater had said he was going to uh, lob a atomic bomb into the men's room at the Kremlin, and you know just to emphasise that point, it ran once, it scandalised America, got endless free play on all the media channels, and Goldwater probably wasn't going to run, but it, it just emphasised that he was a bit of a loose cannon. Each other, or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Yeah, and you know, like I, LBJ was a master of the negative campaigning, and, and he did do some pretty terrible things. And I'm told without actually knowing that, that Texas was a pretty terrible place. Uh, in the 60s, uh, they did all sorts of dodgy stuff. But, you know, Johnson, uh, to beat some strong incumbent in Texas, uh, spread around a rumour that um, one of his his or his opponent committed bestiality. Um, and, and Johnson, someone hit Johnson up and said, mate, you can't say this. And he said, you know, it's not true. And, he, and Johnson said, well, I know it's not true, but I just want to hear that bastard deny that he f***s pigs. <laughs> You know, yeah, 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 it's it's that's that's going a bit far, but uh, it's an example of a negative campaign that actually worked. Johnson won a race that perhaps he wouldn't have otherwise. And it was brutal, and it was in your face, but it's legendary that statement. And you know, we use it in the vernacular in politics all the time, and people will probably be upset with you know a swear word or anything, but that's an actual quote from Lyndon Johnson. It's what he said. And that's what his aim was, to make his opponent deny doing something disgusting. And and uh, uh, there would have been much more to it than that. That wouldn't have been the only thing that helped Johnson win. But it was, you know, it was just put your opponent under pressure. And, you know, the, the, the next really great set of negative campaigns was the 1988 presidential election where... Oh, they were Bush, brilliant, um, weren't they? Just, just yeah, brilliant. And, Bush was really lagging after the primaries. He had no money. He basically was getting a hiding from Dukakis. And he, he ran a couple of the best campaign ads ever, the um, Willie Horton ad, because uh, someone had asked 
the carcass. Well, if if your wife was raped and murdered, um, would you want the death penalty? He gave a really technocratic answer, and and he'd given a weekend release to a, a rapist who went out and raped and murdered someone. Uh, called Willie Horton, and the controversy was Willie Horton was this big, scary-looking black guy, and they said it was a racist ad. But it had the the, the um, truth behind it because the carcass had given weekend leave passes for for uh, prisoners, and Willie Horton did go out and commit some pretty terrible crimes. And you know that that ad helped change the dynamics of the race. Bush and Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first-degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing the man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime. There's another one that was um, Dukakis in a tank, and people will say, well, Dukakis shouldn't have been in a tank in a tie because he looks like a Muppet. But the ad itself talks about all the, the stuff that he's claimed and then hasn't done or opposed on, on funding the military. And that was a, you know, was, this guy is not only a bit of an idiot, but he doesn't support our military. It was a very, very effective attack ad. Michael Dukakis has opposed virtually every defense system we developed. He opposed new aircraft carriers. He opposed anti-satellite weapons. He opposed four missile systems, including the Pershing II missile deployment. Dukakis opposed the stealth bomber and a ground emergency warning system against nuclear attack. He even criticized our rescue mission to Grenada and our strike on Libya. And now he wants to be our commander in chief. America can't afford that risk. Bush went on to win quite easily because he'd, he'd made himself look a whole lot better than his opponent. Well, that's the thing is politicians tend to do these stunts, don't they? They, you know, the famous one of Don Brash walking the plank and then trying to get his extremely tall frame into a very tiny speedway Waxter. car. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. He, it made Don Brash look awkward, out of touch, um, unbalanced, uh, all of those things in just two 30 second clips, you know, but and they were never really turned uh, turned into attack ads. It was more the media focused on it rather than the than the opposition. Well, there's a, a, a legend in politics that David Shearer holding up the snapper in Parliament was a set up by cunless people to make him look like an idiot. I don't know whether it's true or not, but if I was cunless people, I'd definitely put it around so I could take some credit for doing something good. And that was just an example, like walking the plank or the car, where, which just should never have happened. It, it just absolutely should never have happened. And it allowed the message that Don, who's a friend of both of ours, and we absolutely love to bits, he's a great guy, mm. just wasn't quite fit to be prime minister. Um, and, you know, it, it was the end for Shearer because it just it was a stunt too far. And, and National didn't have to run any ads. And, you know, they didn't have to run negative ads against Cunliffe because everyone had worked out that guy was just horrible. Well, he did it um, to himself when he said he was sorry for being a man. Yeah, you know, it's just like, yeah, well, mate, you might as well have left the election. Now, there's, there's other examples of negative attack ads that, that probably haven't worked and are really beyond the pale. And, and uh, I'm pretty sure George W. Bush apologised to John McCain when some people associated with him push-polled in... Um, uh, South Carolina saying, would you still vote for um, for John McCain if he'd fathered an illegitimate black child? Now, he hadn't. He'd adopted a Bangladeshi daughter, so people sort of knew, but it it, it, it wasn't determinative, but it, it just Bush wasn't happy with it. Um, and you know, it just wasn't a, a good move. Um, it was a step too far and it was a bit out of touch. But that's what happens when you have people that are outside uh, interest groups running the campaigns, because Bush was pretty unhappy with the Swift, Swift Boat Veterans for Truth too, because uh, it highlighted that Kerry had actually gone and served and Bush had got a deferment and gone to the National Guard and hadn't been to Vietnam. And, mm. you know, so so it was turn this around a bit on Kerry. Don't make one of his strengths his strength. Try and make it a weakness. But, it, it, it you know, the Democrats didn't really want to hammer Bush on you know, they couldn't come out and say Bush was a coward. He used his influence to not go to Vietnam. But that's what they really meant or they wanted to say. 
Well, the other thing is uh, there was an attack on McCain too, and I don't remember who did it exactly, but was mocking him how he couldn't raise his arms above his, you know, his hands above his shoulders, and they didn't realize that McCain had actually been brutally tortured when he was captured in Vietnam, and as a result, oh, yeah. he, he could he couldn't raise he could actually couldn't physically raise his hands above his shoulders because of the injuries from that, and it just backfired on the guy that attacked him for it. His his um yeah, I mean his um arms were broken and um, mm. you know and but but it, then it didn't really backfire on trump when he said he he liked the war heroes who weren't captured yeah. um uh yeah uh so yeah sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't but i think trump was just blessed by a truly awful opponent rather than um doing anything particularly special himself mm. yeah and probably one of the best and most underrated negative campaigns um and Obama's team were generations ahead of everyone else in terms of their campaigning. But Romney, as usual, when you finish your primary, you've run out of money. He couldn't get on the airways over the summer. Um, so Obama's team uh, ran a whole lot of ads criticising Romney for being out of touch. And and um, and I think I'm pretty sure they had people who Romney's company, Bain Capital, had bought the firm and then um, offshored it. So lots of people got laid off talking about how Romney had sacked them. And, you know, just just the, there's a, a really terrible photo of Romney with the um, the um, piles of cash at Bain Capital with his colleagues that got lots of airtime. And, and Romney didn't help by getting recorded saying that 47% of Americans um, uh, were basically takers and didn't contribute anything. Um, and the Democrats really hammered that. Uh, and, you know, by the time Romney had some money in the, the um, spring to start advertising, he'd been defined and it was very hard not to be defined mm. as what Obama had chosen to. And Obama ended up winning relatively comfortably. I mean, it wasn't it, it wasn't a dominating win like his previous win, but he still won comfortably. And a lot of that was because he ran a wonderfully negative campaign framing uh, Romney uh, in 2000 um, and um or in 2012, over the summer, before Romney could hit the airwaves, and I remember too the that was one of the first data-driven uh, campaigns at the time. And you know, you and I were both following what Nate Silver was doing, and uh, with with polling and and analysing the numbers. And I had a very public bet with Leighton Smith for a very expensive lunch um, at Sales Restaurant that um, Obama would win and Romney wouldn't, and. Um, you know, Leighton Smith was adamant that Romney was going to win. And, you know, I saw it and you saw it and we were saying, yeah, I don't think so. And we, when I put that bet on and Leighton Smith honoured it, paid it up. You know, we had a very uh, sumptuous lunch uh, over several hours. Um, but that was, again, a, a case of not looking at data, not looking at the information that was actually available to everybody and making a judgment purely on partisan politics. And mm -hmm. that's often the way, isn't it, that people go, oh, look, we want the only way to beat um, Christopher Hopkins is to vote for national. And I sit there and say, well, it's not the only way. <laughs> there's, yeah. Yeah. there's never just one way, you know. No. But uh, no. if we're going to talk about negative campaigning, we have to mention Trump, don't we? Oh, absolute genius at it and a feral genius. I mean, I don't think there's much strategy behind it. I mean, he, he framed Hillary as crooked Hillary, and that was just brilliant because she had been involved in all sorts of dodgy stuff since the, the late 80s, and, and it just, you know, and, and he, he had his crowd chanting, lock her up, and then they couldn't hit him for all the dodgy stuff he'd done, which was legion, uh, so they were both equal. And, you know, now he's calling Joe Biden crooked Joe Biden, the, the corrupt Biden crime family and stuff like that, trying the same, same stuff. Um, mm. His naming, I, I mean, can anyone ever look at Elizabeth Warren and not think Pocahontas? Um, <laughs> just like, yeah, 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 this is and, brilliant. And, little and, Marco you know, Rubio, he destroyed Marco yeah, Rubio, caught by and, calling him Little Marco. And low energy Jeb. And I mean, at one stage you were naming a whole bunch of New Zealand politicians. Yeah. And, um, and, and when I found out that Jacinda had been given My Little Pony two Christmases in a row by her best friend, I called you up and said, Cam, look, this is going a bit far. Like, you can't, like, let's, and so her name got changed to Socialist Cindy. Yeah. Um, 
And, you know, it, it sort of it, it had some impact, but not really, because New Zealanders don't really hate socialists like Americans and like we do. But, you know, it was it was that was just part of a, a fairly simple naming convention. And, you know, Trump didn't work in 2020 with Sleepy Joe because it was a referendum on on um, that wasn't he, he, he Trump wanted it to be a referendum on his record. And Biden wanted it to be a choice, and COVID let Biden go and sit in, the, in his basement, not do anything, and let Trump go out and flail away. And, and the public didn't really have much of a campaign, and Biden won. Just back to um, to you know the nickname for Jacinda Ardern is My Little Pony. You might be interested to know who came up with that. It was actually Paula Bennett. Oh, and, was it? <laughs> yeah, and you know, you know, she always claims that she was above all that sort of stuff, but she, she's actually one of the nastiest politicians that I've ever had the displeasure of ha- interacting with, and uh, it was it was her that would do it, and in typical style of Paula Bennett and Bill English, they did all this nasty stuff, but they let other people say it, and they looked, yeah. at, you know, they stood at the back, and and you know, it's like the. It's like the the naughty kids in kindy, right? They push other kids to do naughty things. It was them who instigated it, and then when it all goes south on the, on the uh, on the person who's just got caught, they go, "Oh no, I told them not to do that," you know. And that was the thing that I always remember about Paula Bennett. She was deeply negative and deeply nasty. And, uh, and I was, she never got uh, caught for it. I mean, you've got to no. admire that. That's a real skill. I mean, how many other people do you know like that? Just just wonderful to be able to get away with it in politics yeah she's lucky that um that a friend of ours who's got an audio recording of a meeting with her and simon bridges and 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 a friend of mine has never actually got got into public because that would reveal the true nastiness of both simon bridges and paula bennett but they never were nasty themselves when they were campaigning uh that's the thing is they were nasty in the back room but not actually when it came to 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 doing it with ads or doing it in politics uh, in an overt way. And the National Party falls down on this quite regularly, don't they? Yeah, and, you know, that, that part of it is, is that unlike in the US, they don't really have proxies that they genuinely work with. I mean, the, the, the logical proxy for them to work with is the TU. And the Taxpayers Union, um, they have always kept at arm's length and thought of a bit beneath them. Um, you know, Groundswell, wonderful organisation, wonderful guys. National treats them with contempt rather than thinking they could be useful for for running some lines for them and helping them smash Labor. Um, it's it's just a degree of insularism and amateurism in um, inside National, and and it's probably also inside Labor when Helen Clark left because she was definitely not an amateur. I mean, the way she did Shipley over was just brilliant, um, mm. but. You know, National are a bunch of amateurs, and if they had have been proper negative campaigners, they would have had a playbook ready for when Jacinda left because she was always going to leave at some point. didn't matter mm. what point it was. But you know, there, there are really only four people that could potentially take over um, or thought they could take over, and everyone knew that it was really going to come down to, to Robertson, Kerry Allen, Michael Wood, or Chris Hipkins. And, you know, I, I remember when uh, Robertson got quite upset with you calling him a, a, a cardi wearing civil servant straight off the set of gliding on. And oh, you know, for- he, he, he did look like Jim. He still does. <laughs> he, does. Looks, he looks like Jim out of gliding on. And he, he tweets back at you, I don't own a cardi. <laughs> and, and it's like, yeah, okay, well, maybe you don't own a cardi, but you still look like a civil servant straight off the set of gliding on. Um, and you know, Kerry Allen. The rumours were legendary about her, um, her, her drinking and her appalling treatment of staff. Well, before the stories broke, I mean, they would have mm. been able to. Some like this isn't a, a. You don't necessarily have to be really aggressive with it. You just come out and say, "Well, I hope Kerry can handle handle the pressure and she can take control of her drinking and work with staff a bit better." And there you've de- defined her as as uh, uh, someone who can't cope with pressure, a drinker. And someone was horrible boss. to her staff. Yeah. And, you know, and, and if that had been her mess, the message about her, she would have had to struggle against those things. Um, and, you know, Michael Wood, I mean, Michael Wood, he, he's just a slimy little bastard. And you just look at him and you think, mate, you can't be Prime Minister. Most people want to smack you in the face. 
Now, that's not politically correct to say, but it's it's the blink test. And the time you blink, you probably do think with that guy, that with that guy. And, you know, the, he, he just reminds me a lot of, of Simon Bridges. And, and when Bridges got rolled, the word clouds about him were just horrible. And mm. I hope you can share them, but it was di- dickhead, slimy, sw- smarmy. Weasel. It's just absolutely. Yeah, absolutely was... horrible. And, you know, that's how I would have defined Michael Wood um, to start with. And and then I would have um, gone on and said something like, oh, this bastard's useless. I mean, he couldn't build a house of cards with a buddy pack of cards and a kid helping him, let alone build light rail. I mean, where's the light rail running through his electorate? We're not closer to that than when he became minister. I mean, just absolutely useless. And, yeah, that would have been the truth plus reflecting what most people feel about Michael Wood. I mean, you know, if, if we had have been uh, managing Michael Wood, we would have got the bloody hair gel out of his hair and tried to make him look like he, he didn't think he was better than everyone else. Well, that was the problem, you see, is every time I looked at Michael Wood, I saw two things. The first was Basil Brush, and I was expecting him to go boom, boom every time he said something because he even talked the same way as Basil Brush, you know, sort of machine gunning words out. Mm. And the second one is I thought you just if you were just a little bit rounder and had a little bit thinner hair and tucked your hand into your pocket, you'd look like Napoleon. And <laughs> and and that and that and I said that out loud or I wrote that somewhere. And then what I heard is that all the politicians in Wellington started calling him little Napoleon. And that was really the undoing of them because they they hear these nicknames, you know. And, and they stick, and they do, especially if they're really accurate. And you know, not I'm guilty of giving some politicians some appalling nicknames, you know, um, just playing on their name or whatever. Um, but they stick, and that's what Trump did so so well. But we're we not seeing any of that from Luxon, and I think National as well are just in total are um, uh, are forgetting that it is a part of the toolkit to actually go negative. And, you know, when you've got Chris Bishop having a whine in the media um, about all these scurrilous attack ads that are going on, uh, they're not scurrilous. I mean, it's a no. picture, it's a dodgy photo of Christopher Luxon with, with basically saying you can't trust him. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. it, it's, so, not, and, it's and, not bad. No, no, no. It is, and and it is. It's absolutely a reflection of Labor not being able to run on their record, so they've got to run against Luxon. And you know, Luxon's net favourables aren't good. He isn't popular with with many New Zealanders. People said, "Oh, well, when he gets out and people know him better, they'll like him more." And and in fact, that was in the polls here. Sort of ninety one percent of people knew him, and his net favourables were negative five. So it wasn't exactly as if he was going to become popular overnight by getting out there. Um, and you know, they, they, they genuinely could frame him as being out of touch and and not understanding normal people. And, a, you know, a guy that all his reading has been self-help books and he speaks management bullshit. You know, if, if, if I had been bloody running Labor's internal campaign, I would have set up bullshit bingo for Parliament with the phrases that uh, Luxon uses that are management bullshit and have, you know, have the, the backbenchers all yell out bingo when they filled their bingo card with his bullshit phrases. Mm. Um, you know, just take the piss out of him. But, you know, if, we, if we we're going to name him, I mean, you and I had a bit of a disagreement on how we name him. I reckon he should be called Uncle Fester because he looks dead set, a dead ringer for Uncle Fester out of the, 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 um, the Adams family. Mm, and I reckon he looks like Captain Underpants. Um, yeah. You know, and and I, and I think that kind of resonates a bit better because there's this hapless superhero, you know, battling the evil Labour Party, um, but getting everything wrong along the way. And yeah, they, they, they could have tried that, and, you know, a really clever Labour attack. Uh, and, and they needed to do this when he first became leader was was get him defined as Uncle Fester. So every time anyone's seen him or Captain Underpants. You know, they're either seeing the Adams family or, you know, the, the theme for Adams family or something like that. And, you know, hammer his likability, not his policies, because uh, most people don't really care that much about policies. And, and if you compare Nationals' policies with Labor's, uh, there's a chance Labor might, uh, sorry, a chance National might implement their policies. There's no chance at all Labor will implement theirs. They're just useless, uh, yeah. except the bad ones, the really bad ones where they create division through co-governance and stuff. 
Um, the you know they 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 just you know they can't sort out school truancy. They can't fill potholes and roads. They can't build houses. You know they they are useless. They couldn't build they a house get, in a room full of Lego. Yeah, and you know you've got to think that. Hammering his likability, and 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 that's probably where I'd criticise the CTU. They they're starting to criticise policies. I would be more inclined to run a campaign against Luxon with normal New Zealanders saying Chris Luxon doesn't understand me, and giving the public a permission structure to um to be um to to vote against him because of what they instinctively feel. I, I mean, I spent the summer with people asking me, oh, Simon, what's going to happen in the election? I said, well, what do you think of Luxon? Oh, and uh, well, that, that pretty much sums it up. No one really knows. And Luxon isn't a good leader. Um, and that if he was, National would be way up in the polls. And, and pretty much all my friends are either ACT or National voters, some are New mm. Zealand First voters, none of them left-wingers, and they all want National to do well, and they yeah, well, I get that. Luxon doesn't, you know, I don't. he doesn't resonate with me. I don't really like him in the way that I like John Key. And, you know, people on the right really like Don Brash because he stood for the stuff that we believed in. Um, and, you know, but, but Luxon, well, I don't quite know what he actually stands for, really. Um and that's how I would have been running the the negative campaign. Mm. You know, so they're saying out of touch, too much risk, and and you know, I really would have been playing the man, not the ball on this. I would have just been absolutely hammering the perception that Luxon is unlikable, which the polls show. Um, and you know, I really would just be getting normal people saying, I don't think Chris Luxon understands me, and it, it's just that permission structure for people to vote based on what they instinctively feel. Well, I always like to ask women uh, what they think about politicians because usually it comes down to some unknown personality trait or, or uh, you know, blink test vision that they've got. So if you ask um, uh, you know, women about Winston, um, they generally go, oh, he's a bit of a silver fox, isn't he? You ask them about John Key, they're going, oh, yeah, I wouldn't mind him parking his slippers under my bed. Um, but no one, literally, that I've spoken to has said anything positive about Christopher Luxon. Um, he's just not likable. And, and and there's a disconnect, and I've I've you know analyzed it like I do with all other politicians. And uh, it's come down to an, what I consider to be inauthentic uh, behavior. He's got slogans that he's rehearsed and mouths, but the body language doesn't match the slogans. And so it gives you that, you know, fleeting glimpse that this guy doesn't actually believe what he's saying. And so you get this this disquiet, this unease that occurs in your mind fleetingly, but rots away. It's, it, and so when you actually sit down with them, people and say, well, tell me what you like about Christopher Luxon, what you usually hear is a, is a very long pause, a very long pause that you could drive a truck through before they say, well, um, and that's all you need to know. That's all you need to know about him. And that emphasises why National probably should have been running a negative campaign against Labor because they couldn't win on likability. You know, Helen Clark was highly unpopular when she became leader. I mean, famously, she had 2% in the preferred prime minister polls and she took Labor down to 14% in one poll. And mm. she was a fine prime minister, but she didn't make it a presidential campaign about her. She just hammered the shit out of National. And Shipley just looked so terrible that that when it came to voting day, no one really could vote for National willingly. It was a grudging vote. And Helen Clark came in and and, and won. And that's what I would have been doing if I had have had uh, Luxon's campaign because you can't make a person likable. You know, it's just you either are or you aren't. You can try and make them a little less inauthentic, but that's hard. I just sort of had him, look, this isn't good enough. Our country's going backwards. These bastards are wrecking it, and this is how they're wrecking it. Now, you know, you can't take them seriously ever and just absolutely hammer them, just really hammer Labor on their ineptness. And I'd I'd also make the point I wouldn't be hammering them on the stuff that the reality check radio people are really passionate about. Mm. That doesn't resonate with most of New Zealand. You look at the the vaccine stats and the vast numbers of New Zealanders have had their vaccine. They may not have liked it, but they've had it. So, 
you wouldn't go on about being made to take your vaccines or you would hammer them on the lockdowns. I mean, why did we have lockdowns in Auckland? Well, because they quarantined people at risk in Auckland instead of quarantining them somewhere else where it didn't matter and Auckland wouldn't get shut down. Yeah, that was just inept. But you wouldn't be going on about the stuff that your listeners all are very passionate about because it is a very much a niche position. You'd, you'd concentrate on the stuff that everyone is concerned about. You know, there's no one sensible isn't worried about the no. truancy. You can't, what you'd, you'd, you'd concentrate on would be um, co- coercion and mandates and those sorts of things because it's completely against the Bill of Rights. Um, but they're, but they're you, academic you, arguments that um, they're not even – you know, cogent supporters of of absolute freedoms for everything can actually elucidate in a way that is uh, beneficial to the lowest common denominator uh, in the electorate. You know, the vote the voters on the street that are going to the factories every day, but the lockdowns it's not win definitely votes. no. But the lockdowns do because they they lost yeah. their jobs or they or they had to stay at home with their manky misses or. You know, whatever. Yeah, their business suffered, or they had to spend three months with their kids being homeschooled, and you know, mm. it was that that kind of stuff was was is going to have cut through. Whereas, um, the for most of the public, the vaccine mandates aren't a big thing. Uh, that uh, they, the numbers are pretty clear on that. People voted by getting their vaccines, and most people did. Um, but that doesn't mean you couldn't attack Labor for some of their ineptness. And, you know, National really should be piling into them over there, their rats tests and their masks that are hanging around. And, you know, forgetting, I think the other forgetting one, to order things, you know, all yeah, of those. Well, that was Hipkins. Six yeah. weeks he forgot to order the vaccines, which kept us locked down for longer. I mean, if I was in Auckland, I would have been absolutely ropeable about being locked down. We were. Yeah, and you know, that that was when the polls changed. Um the those lockdowns really hurt. Labor because they started losing Auckland and you basically win and lose the elections in Auckland. Mm. So with the with the current negative ads, let's let's just rip through those now and see whether they're important or not important, uh, or effective or not effective. Let's start with um, with Acts One because they kind of kicked off the negative campaigning season with their uh, attack ads against Winston. They. Uh, they, they really need to have a good, long, hard look at themselves. That that ad was a terrible ad. Um, there's a whole lot of things you can say about Winston that would have been much more effective. But when people don't know what the ad is about, whether it's for Winston or against Winston, it's just a terrible ad. And it, it sort of s- s- uh, speaks to the fact that there's a whole lot of insiders in ACT that know all this stuff and they, 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 they're probably not circulating with the – they're probably the – 95 or 97 percent of the population who simply just don't care about politics and wake up at election time and have a bit of a think about it and then vote and most of them just vote the same way uh, it wouldn't have got past a a, um, a decent research um, uh, person like Farah and it wouldn't have got past a um, well it wouldn't have been created if they had have used focus groups to test it you know there's, there's other stuff that they could have run on Winston but the execution and the message were just inefficient. Um, and strategically, why are you attacking Winston? I mean, the real enemy for you is Labor and the Greens and the Maori Party. Have mm-hmm. a crack at them. Um, you, you at least in theory can work a little bit with, with Winston. You can't work with the others at all. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I know that they don't like Winston, but sometimes you've just got to be pragmatic. And, and, and it's probably why you and I get on really well with people in Labor, because we're quite happy to whack them and we're quite happy to take a whack back from them and they don't take it personally. They think it's part of the game and, you know, we're just good mates with them because they're good mm. people and we disagree with them, but it doesn't mean that we have to hate them. Yeah, and, exactly. and I think that perhaps a little bit of act is, oh, well, we hate these people and instead of thinking, you know, it is part of the game, you've got to, to take a few knocks. And while you'd spend money on effectively promoting Winston when he's below 5% at the time the ad came out, I don't know. I just uh, couldn't really make sense of it. Well, he's over 5% now, and every ad, every poll, so ACT has actually helped Winston. So it's yeah. a little, so so we'd have to say it's a, a two out of 10 for intent and a zero out of 10 for, e- for execution. I'd just give them zero all around. It's just something that a, a dispassionate campaign manager would have blocked straight away. It's like, come on, guys, yeah, grow up. Focus uh, on the target. Yeah, and and you know, if you 
really got to annoy Winston. You know, you, you're far better off saying, well, Winston, you went with Labor. And, you know, that, that is a, he did go with Labor. It's true. Yeah, it's a valid, it's a valid criticism. It's one that's used all the time. But, uh, mm. you know, Act should have, you know, he they should have run it. You can't trust Winston. Yeah, you know, he won't uh, won't honor the wishes of of the majority or whatever. But uh, yeah. they just they just and, went personal, you know. And, and I don't think it worked, especially as the photo was um, Winston smiling, and Winston smiling is far more appealing than Winston scowling. Well, and far more appealing than David Seymour in any way. I mean, I'm looking at the photo now, and it's just like if Winston could have paid Act to put a photo up, they would have he would have paid him to put that one up. Yeah, pick that um, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. about the CTU attack ads that were launched this week, um, you know, masquerading as a front page on the Herald? I mean, there's some issues around the Herald actually allowing that to occur in the way that it did without saying, well, hang on a second, this is going to reflect on our brand as much as it is on um, on Christopher Luxon. Oh, look, I, I think the Herald is probably uh, trying to take any money they can before they go broke. So I don't have too many problems with the Herald running those ads. Um, I liked part of the message of the CTU um, ads. I, I, you know, the, the out of touch part I thought was good. I'm not sure about the too much risk because I don't think the average person thinks that the government agencies are particularly competent and cutting money for incompetent agencies is probably quite a good thing in the view of most people. Um, I just would have been really putting the the message out there that, you know, Luxon doesn't understand people like me. He really is out of touch. He's just not a guy that you want to go and have a beer with, and you can't have a beer with him. And, you know, I would have He doesn't drink normal, for a start. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd, I'd, I'd have normal people saying that. You know, I probably would have got someone who, you know, I work for Air New Zealand and, I, you know, as a tradie, and I left to set up my own business because I hated those rich pricks in those shiny suits that thought they knew better than me, and they bloody could all they could do in a plane is sit in a seat. They couldn't fix it, you know, and just stuff like that, you know. And, mm. and no one wants to vote for their boss. Um, now that's not quite true, but it's a message that most people would instinctively understand. Like no one would vote for their mother-in-law. Mm. Um, you know, it's just. That that would I would be concentrating not so much on nationals policies, and I would be comp- I really would be playing the man a lot more than the ball. Yeah. So, how do you defend against negative campaigns? Well, the first thing you do is you don't have a sook about it. I mean, I was, look, Chris Bishop, who was a gifted politician and won a seat that he had no right to win through sheer hard work and really good strategy, and yeah, you know, you, you've got to admire Chris Smith, uh, Chris. Um, Bishop driving um, Trevor Mallard out of Hart South. I mean, that is a work of a genius politician. And for him to come out and complain about it, I mean, Jesus, like, doesn't he understand basic rules? You know, if a, if someone bullies you, you don't whinge about it, you whack him back and you whack him back hard. You know, National should have come out straight away and been really aggressive saying, Labor can't run on their record because the record's appalling. I mean, these guys are just useless. That's why they're running against us. You know, we're happy to run on Labor's record of failure. They failed to build light rail. They failed to build the 100,000 Kiwi built houses. They failed to buy the vaccines in time. They failed to improve our hospitals and polytechs with stupid, expensive bureaucratic reforms. They pissed away all that money on um, re- uh, merging the um, uh, TVNZ and Radio New Zealand for no real purpose. They failed a generation of school kids who wagged school with no consequence, and they failed our, con- our communities by not stopping the ram rates. Labor can go on as much as they like about us, but they really should look at the mirror and see the people that have failed at every step in government and mm. have failed New Zealanders. You know, and, and yeah, smack Hipkins hard in the face about his failures and just reinforce that message and not complain about it. You know, and and they really should have. If they had have been professional, they would have had that playbook ready for when Jacinda went. And you know, there weren't many people that could take over, and you knew the messages that you could run on the people that took over, and you could define them quickly, and and the public would have largely accepted the definition because they're basically true. That then leads to what negative campaigning should emphasise. And what you've got some thoughts on that about what you should uh, focus your negative campaigning on, and what you should reinforce, or what you should echo uh, out there. 
Yeah, and, and, and you've, you, you've got to stop being cerebral about it and think about what the, the, the guy at the rugby club is, is, is thinking and on a Saturday afternoon, which is generally he doesn't think about politics at all and he has a, a visceral reaction to things. And, you know, like if you're campaigning against co-governance and you don't trust Luxon on co-governance because you know Chris Finlayson's hanging around, your negative uh, campaign is going to, the theme of it, and it won't quite say this, is don't yeah. let Luxon sell us out to the Maoris. Um, you can't say that in New Zealand these days, but that's the message, and it has to be a bit more subtle. And you know that would be from the right, but very much the the, the from the left, it's you know, Luxon doesn't understand people like me, and he's out of touch. A bloke that owns seven houses hasn't got a clue how hard it is to get a deposit together for your first house. Yeah, you know, he he doesn't understand what a struggle it is to afford the the school uniforms for our kids when we're we're paying so much in mortgage costs because we can't afford our um uh, or we, we've bought a house and the interest rates have gone up. Yeah, you know, and and act well act and I think David Seymour has done an admirable job until the last few months where he's made a few pretty basic mistakes. Uh, and but you know, over the last 10 years, he's been consistently the best around, mm. but ACT are really pro-immigration. Yeah, and, and, you know, the, the attacks on ACT are really simple. ACT means more immigrants, and immigrants will block our roads, they'll take our jobs, they'll fill our hospitals, they'll fill our schools. We can't have ACT doing that to our country. We can't have ACT in government until we've got hospitals that don't have huge waiting lists and long waiting times. We can't have ACT bringing in more immigrants when all the roads in Auckland are absolutely chock-a-block and gridlocked. You know, we can't have low-wage immigrants coming in and driving down our uh, the wages of our workers. You know, that, that would be the negative attack that you'd, you'd have a crack on with, with ACT. And, you know, ACT genuinely are classical liberals. They do believe in immigration, and it, so it's the truth. It's not particularly personal, but that's how you'd attack ACT. And and Seymour, and, and this is where one of the things that I admire him for, because he actually genuinely does have beliefs, would, would probably accept that, that he believes in immigration. And he would try and persuade people with his argument that immigration was actually good rather than complaining about someone having a go at him over immigration. And you know, that that there's not many politicians in New Zealand who are brave enough and have the courage of the convictions to argue when the, mm. something they're doing is pretty unpopular. I always, I thought the other day that uh, Winston uh, could have a bit of a crack at the other leaders uh, because, you know, he's got his, his horse ad, which is going gangbusters on social media. I think it's had around 150,000 views now on Twitter. Um, he could challenge uh, the other leaders to, uh, you know, show how they can get on a horse and you end up with a Don Brash situation. I mean, watching Chris Hipkins try and climb on the back of a horse would be just laughable given how small and tiny he is. And watching Christopher Luxon do it, it would be even funnier. Um, mm. Or James Shaw, you know, um, but the only uh, leaders that would probably leap on the back of a horse with better skills than Winston would be uh, the Maori Party leaders. Well, Maribyrn Davidson might be able to, but you know, and, and and I think that if we compare it to to what Helen Clark would say, if someone came and asked her, she would just shut that down straight away because it's just you know she was way too smart to get trapped into doing something like that. Um, but it is it it yeah uh, it, it is something that probably could have happened, um, and you know it was a it was a good ad. It, it made Winston look happy and smiley, and and emphasised his experience, and he's been there before. Um, and the big thing was is that everyone looks at it and they're like, yeah, we might not like Winston that much, but, yeah, we quite like having him around. He's quite fun. Well, he's a rascal in a scallywag, and I think we need to have rascals and scallywags in Parliament. That's my view anyway. Well, yeah, I think you know. I think we've uh, traversed uh, negative campaigning in a way that people have never heard before, that there is some benefits to negative campaigning. It doesn't all have to be nasty. But the most important uh, thing about negative campaigning is it needs to be truthful. Yeah, and it, it has to be based on stuff that people instinctively understand. If they don't instinctively understand, complete waste of time. Um, and, you know, that, that's where some of the stuff that we've um, highlighted it will show good campaigns doing good things to define their opponents. 
Well, hopefully we'll have time for another analysis. We'll see if, if there's any more negative ads, and maybe we can do a, a redux of this closer to the election uh, to educate people on whether it was successful or not successful. And, of course, the polls will show that as well. Yep, and obviously we have opinions, and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're not. But, uh, yeah, the polls will tell us. Yeah, I mean, we had a lot of feedback about your opinion about Jacinda Ardern and how people thought you were deluded because she thought she was lovely. But, you know, that's a, you're entitled to your opinion. It doesn't make you a bad person because you're wrong on that one. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, see, this is where I would say if those people actually got to spend some time with Jacinda Ardern and have a few drinks with her, they would find it very difficult not to like her in the same way that Michael Cullen really wanted to hate John Key but just couldn't uh, mm. because John Key was just a likeable guy and he wanted to hate him through the debates as finance uh, spokesman in 2005 and just couldn't help liking him. I think that, you know, as much as people don't didn't like what Jacinda did, I think that if they were to go in and, you know, have a decent conversation with her rather than just attack her and treat her as a, as a human, they would be overwhelmed that she was actually quite a nice person, which is absolutely unusual in politics. I mean, how many nice people do you know in politics, Ken? Yeah, not many. Look, nice people can do bad things, and that's what Jacinda Ardern did in the end. She thought she oh, was doing the right thing, but was you know it was pretty terrible. Uh, especially I, I never said I liked her politics. I just liked her as a person. I found her politics abhorrent. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's good to clear that up for the for the listeners. Anyway, yeah. Simon, thank you once again for uh, explaining the ins and outs of some of the darker aspects of politics. And uh, hopefully New Zealand can you know, at least catch up with the Australians when it comes to negative campaigning and uh, aim to be on a par with the Americans because it's a whole lot more fun. Oh, definitely. And you're just telling the truth about people. Exactly. And truth in politics is something that is very scant these days. Yes. Yes. Say what you like about Simon Lusk, but he's one of the best operators in the shadowy back rooms of politics. He certainly shared with you all today just exactly how negative campaigning can and does work. Do you think the same? Don't forget to send comments to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. If you'd like to contact us here at Reality Check Radio, you can email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio or text us by sending your message to 2057. Well, it's that time of the show where we dip into the mailbag. We've got uh, quite a bit here to get through, some long ones as well. Some general feedback and guest suggestions. Uh, We've got Mike who says, Hi, Cam, well done. You set us up and we responded as you expected. If my wife was still around to balance me, I would have listened to the entire interview with your mate Simon Lusk and not listened to him long enough to piss me off and turn him off. I see now after listening to the whole show what point you were trying to make re free speech and the right for everyone to speak their mind. I do believe he is a poor judge of character and is probably a bit blind when it comes to Marxism, but I do believe he is a Labour supporter in the long run. His comment re jackboot, being a nice person, is proof of his poor judgment of character. He is, though, a very competent political commentator and political analyst. And if he wasn't, he wouldn't be as sought after as he is. Again, well done, and I'll try and keep an open mind in the future. Re your political tragics. Hi, Cam. Rosa here. Now that NZ Loyal is a registered party, I trust she will be interviewed. Well, I would interview Liz Gunn, but she refuses to come on the show. So there's nothing that I can do about that. The invitation stands, but with six weeks left to go till the election, she's running out of time. Anonymous says, Liz Gunn for Cam's buddies. Jan says, hi, Cam. We must take our country back before we lose it altogether. Save our children, save our farmers. God bless New Zealand. 
Sandra says, hi, Cam, I listened to you with Sandra Gowdy re-voting, and I understood from your conversation that voting for a smaller party who doesn't get over the 5% will have their votes given to the bigger party. I'm very confused, as are my friends. Can you clarify this, please? Well, Sandra, we've done that this week. I had David Farrer on. It's not the votes that are given to the bigger parties. It's the potential seats that they might have won had they met, met the threshold. So, you know, it's a little confusing, but the effect is the same, is that the larger parties have a better chance of picking up those wasted votes seats. An interesting fact received via email from the Electoral Commission that your listeners may not know. I didn't until now re-party lists. If a party list does not contain enough names to fill that party's allocated seats in Parliament, those seats will be left vacant until the allocation for the next general election. I wonder how many of the minor parties know this. That's a good good comment there from the anonymous commenter, and I hope people do uh, take that up and look at it. Got some comments from Facebook. Can't wait until 7 a.m. with Paul and spend evenings catching up with Marie, Rodney, and Jaspreet, as well as Cam Slater. I don't have a life now, thanks, RCR. You guys rock. Uh, Robin says, really good show, Cam. So varied and such interesting guests and discussions. Mark says, great show yesterday. And Kerry says, love it. I've got some negative feedback now, which is good. Uh, Mike says, Cam, I don't agree with your statement that if this regime gets back in, we just vote in a new government next time. Are you serious? The power of the duopoly have now is huge and they will never give up the power they now have because sheeple have just given into them and they know they can keep their foot on their necks. If we have to go through another three years of tyranny, I think a civil war could break out and we need to stand up. Are you forgetting it's not just the tyrants we have there now in the beehive? It's the backing that they have. Show us what you really want, Cam. I'm getting a bit sick of the platitudes and the baiting. Say what it is you would like to see. I'm wondering if you're becoming a bit soft and are just placating your guests. Tanya was great, but you were not. You. She had you eating out of her hand and you just ran with it. Please get a guest that you can pose hard questions to. Oh, Mike, I think we need to have open discussions with people and it's not just about machine gunning guests and slamming them as hard as they can. I'm not Mike Hosking, and I don't want to be like Mike Hosking. I want people to hear what everyone has to say, even if you don't like that person or their politics. You know, And hopefully I'm going to have some Labour Party people on before the election, and you might not like what they have to say, but you should at least listen to them. Regarding the Hekka Robertson New Zealand Freedoms interview, Cam and Hekka, yet another inspirational interview. Thank you. We heard how the power of unconditional acceptance, responsibility, and humility changes the world. How wonderful if this movement could coalesce our nation. And if this behavior could be adopted by bureaucrats, we live in hope. And that was from Janet. And Janet also commented on Chris Trotter saying, Cam and Chris, another civil engineering piece of trivia. In 1953, it took six days over Christmas to replace the railway bridge over the Whangaihu River in Tangawai. Marvellous Kiwis could do the way that it was. Jan says, hi, Cam, that was great, fantastic, very informative chat with Chris Trotter. Well done, and I know who to vote for. Thank you. Joy says, Cam and Chris, I salute you both for your honesty and your loyalty to your country. Having worked with Chris on many occasions, I admire his new truth. Thank you. Anonymous says, hi, Cam, just typed this and lost it. I enjoyed your chat with Chris Trotter, though I'm not a lefty. He talks sense, and I'll be giving one vote at least to Winston and hope he can join forces with Luxon as I'm scared of Seymour, the two-faced globalist. And I wonder if Luxon is too. What bothers me is the fact that they'll use those Dominion vote counting machines, I believe again. And there is, I understand, no way to check the votes that are manipulated through these machines. Did anyone believe Biden got 88 million votes? Really? We don't have those dirty cheats here. Good luck, Winston. And that was from Caroline. 
Chris says, Cam, I listened to your interview with Chris Trotter and enjoyed the interaction. You are both, however, still bogged down in the right-left mindset. Here is something more applicable, the horseshoe model, which is now something that's more applicable, with the bottom of the horseshoe being where the left and right establishments meet, and the top is where many populists, freedom lovers now meet, drawn from both the left and the right. Regarding my interview with Tanya Ankovic from New Zealand First, Dot says, thank you so much, Cam, for all your guests. They have been fantastic, even though I don't always agree, but I definitely have something to think about. Your guest tonight, Tanya, is a beautiful breath of fresh air. Speaking so clearly and eloquently, she was a delight to listen to, and I loved what she had to say. I just wish I was living in Epsom, as I would definitely vote for her. Your vast political knowledge has been really informative to listen to, and I wish that I'd taken more notice of politics earlier in my life. I'm 70 now, but going to make sure I pay attention. Keep it up, Cam. I love listening to all sides of an issue, and you certainly bring them all for us. Comments on Tanya's replay post from Facebook, which includes one from the lady herself. Robin says, cracking session, thank you. Marion says, great interview. And Tanya Ankovic says, thank you for the opportunity to speak. A great conversation. And that's it for the mailbox or the mailbag this week. And we look forward to getting your feedback next week. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy right here on RCR. Right, that's it for The Crunch this week. This show covered a lot of ground from the need for minor parties to work together to the effect of wasted votes on how independent journalism is vital to democracy and a very deep dive into negative campaigning. With just six weeks to go and just three weeks until early voting begins, it's vitally important you keep yourself well informed. And that's why we are here at Reality Check Radio to give you both sides of any story or issue. And it's a job we all love doing. Educate yourselves, make a difference by voting, and continue your support of stations like this. It's been a real pleasure having you all back this week. I'm loving all your feedback and really enjoying talking to so many people sharing their thoughts on politics, life, and everything in between. But there's plenty more in this election that we need to crunch into. So a big shout out to all of you. Thank you for listening and having faith in me as we continue to explore this beautiful game of politics. Don't forget, email suggestions to inbox at realitycheck.radio for people for me to interview. And let's make this show the best political show in New Zealand. Stay tuned for a breakfast show repeat coming up next with features including Money Talks with my buddy Farzan Irani and Perigo's perspective with the one and only Lindsay Perigo. Looking forward to having you join me again next Thursday at 4pm for The Crunch with Cam Slater. You've been listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Remember, you can check out the replays for today's show on our website at www.realitycheck.radio forward slash replays. Tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. for more with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio.